uh, photolytic dissociation of ozone to form an atom of oxygen to recombine with a uh, molecule of oxygen to form ozone. Okay, so the, the source is oxygen and sun. Other questions? Other good questions? Okay. And to be honest, these are hard things to replicate in the laboratory, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think part of the answer to uh, the questions you're asking, I'm guessing people don't know, right, with, with real scientific certainty. But I'll see if I can look into it a little bit more. I'm going to change gears into uh, global warming, but are there any other questions before we do that? It's nice to know that a story can have a happy ending. We're doing something for the future, right? And um, climate change is, is uh, something we've known about about as long as we've known about uh, the ozone hole. Uh, but we haven't reacted as fast. Any thoughts about that? I had a question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we're always like a step behind catching up with pollution levels and so on. Whatever interventions we make, substitute chemicals for all these CFCs, how do we make sure that they don't cause any unforeseen effects? Yeah. Any research being done? We're always behind the eight ball, right? <coughs> well, hopefully, and, and that's a, a large degree why we need to create awareness that engineers have an impact on, on the environment, chemical engineers, mechanical, electrical, etc. cetera. Right? The decisions we make, uh, there's no guarantee that anything we do uh, won't have an impact in the future. Uh, we look at carbon dioxide. This is one of the most inert gases you can imagine. And look at the impact that we're going to talk about here beginning today. Uh, the fact is that everything we do is going to have a negative impact at some degree. There's a nice book. It's called uh, The Dose is the Poison. Right? Anything in a small enough dose really isn't a problem. The, the question becomes when you create a system where there is so much consumption and throughput that now you get very unnatural concentrations and accumulations of compounds, then strange things can happen. And no, we're, we're never going to be omnipotent, omnipotent uh, in, at least enough, right? If you're I guess there's no degree of omnipotency, right? You either are or you're, you aren't. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're never going to get there, at least in our lifetime. Uh, so there's, a, there's never a guarantee, but we can get smarter, right? We can learn about the earth. Uh, we can learn from the lessons of the past. And, and that's really what we're trying to do here. That's why we talk about an introduction to environmental science in this class, right? Uh, we could just say that CFCs are bad and CO2 is bad. And uh, we could talk about uh, methane being bad and nitrous oxide being bad, uh, particulate matter being bad. Uh, but it comes down to doses and, and how bad, and you know, if you change one process for another process, uh, what are the possible implications of that? Uh, trying to get people to look forward. Uh, you know, there are, again, there's no insurance policies on this, but there are a lot of people looking into environmental issues. A lot of people have internalized it. There's a lot of work on the campus of the University of Michigan, around the world, the governments uh, studying the earth, trying to come up with cohesive sets of data that we can use to monitor uh, the Earth. There was a big conference in Washington, D.C. just a month ago, a month or two ago, uh, about Earth monitoring and doing a better job of this. Uh, so we can begin to control and better understand before it's too late some of the impacts that we're having. Uh, there's a nice quote, and I believe it's in your course pack. Um, and right now, the individual to attribute it to uh, escapes me. Uh, but the quote goes something like this, just because you don't know everything, right? You shouldn't take that to mean you don't know anything, right? And we're learning a lot. Uh, and, and maybe climate change is one of these areas uh, where we can learn the lesson, right? We've been much slower to react. Does anybody have any opinions why that might be? Probably politics and selling people. I mean, when you learn about something new, you have to actually sell people on that idea. Well, what's the difference between the ozone hole and, and climate change? What's different about these things? Because we have to sell the public on that. With the ozone hole, you have one series of reactions that very obviously takes something out of the ozone layer. Uh, so climate change is less obvious? A big it's more hole? Complicated. Say it? It's more complicated. Uh, climate change is more complicated. Is it more complicated? Yes. Harder hmm. to measure, maybe? 
The impacts could be harder to measure. Complication is a, a matter of opinion. I would argue that the cause and effect of releasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere should be pretty obvious. We'll say more about that in a few minutes. Okay, now you get back into temperature and the impact, maybe it is, right? You have a big hole of ozone and you go outside and people get scum, skin burned, right? That's quite, right? That's instant, instantaneous observation. The observability might be a different way to describe it, right? Rather than complication, it's something much more observable. No, I mean, it kind of goes back to why it takes so long. Is kind of going back to the frog picture in the tub you showed. I mean, we're not going to react until... Slower goes. change, right? Uh, suddenly we had an ozone hole, and we can measure that right away. Yeah, that was probably accumulating over 30, 40, 50 years even, right? But suddenly we saw it, and it was there. But climate change, yes, uh, it's a lot harder to observe. It goes back to observability again. Uh, how fast is the change? We notice fast change. We don't necessarily notice a uh, slow change. That's a big factor here. Well, and it goes back to the saying, I guess, you can't manage what you can't measure, and maybe they're trying to find a universal way to measure it. Um, and until that's, I mean, I mean, temperature, <coughs> global temperature, I guess, is one measurement, but maybe. Yeah, maybe there's other things, anecdotal evidence also. But also, these things are, are quite inert. I mean, there's when you release a little bit of it, I mean, there's no bells and whistles going off that, that this is really, really a bad thing to do. We breathe carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. right? So we're all contributing to global warming to some degree, right? Maybe we should all be taxed for breathing. Right? There was a proposal in Canada, I'm not joking, <laughs> uh, about this. Uh, it was kind of a joke, but uh, it's real. Uh, anyway, uh, I should pick that one up. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it is an earth. It's also more pervasive, right? Who uses CFCs? That's industry. You can pin them down a little bit easier. Uh, we all uh, drive. We all uh, uh, combustion processes are part of everyday life. Again, we breathe carbon dioxide, right? So these are all things to keep in mind. It's not quite the same. And uh, if we look at, of course, we got some reading in the, in the course packs on uh, the global warming issue also. But we're, we're only going to have four basic questions for global warming. It's going to take us a long time to, to get through these four. Actually, the last two will take us most of the time, right? Uh, first question for us is uh, global warming real? Uh, the second question is going to be do atmospheric gases trap heat radiated from Earth? Our third question will be does human activity contribute to global warming? And the fourth question will be what are the consequences or potential consequences of global warming? Uh, so let's begin with the, the first uh, question and, and get it out of the way. Okay, within our time frame to make good measurements, which is maybe 100 years, or we've, we've got consistent uh, data sets, uh, the temperature has been going up. And this is a plot, the uh, most recent one I could find on the government database here, um, basically showing a pronounced increase in temperature uh, since 1880, especially in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, if we talk about Earth's temperature, uh, it's risen about uh, 0.3 to 0.6 degrees Celsius. It's almost one degree Fahrenheit, as you can see here. Uh, scale here is in Fahrenheit. Uh, over the past 40 years, the majority of that temperature rise. You can see the steep slope in the last uh, 40 years. So uh, what I would challenge all of us to do is to put all the emotion and baggage and politics of this issue aside and have a prepared mind, right? to use the, the Einstein uh, analogy, right? just have a prepared mind. Uh, let's be open to the data. These are the data. right? Are the data perfect? They're not perfect. Are they our best observations? They are our best observations. Is there anecdotal evidence that goes along with these observations? Uh, there indeed is. If we look at 1998, this is the uh, warmest uh, year on record. Uh, 2002 was the second warmest, 2003 is en route to be the third warmest. We look at the last 15 years in the 20th century. Uh, 10 of the warmest years in the 20th century occurred in the last 15 years. Uh, so you know a little bit of probability. That's highly improbable. Uh, that tells us likely something's going on. Snow cover in the northern hemisphere has decreased. Glaciers are breaking up in the uh, Arctic, in the Antarctic, uh, there was an ice break about the size of Taiwan last year in Antarctica. Uh, 
uh, there is believed, if uh, current trends continue, there will be a shipping route between Europe and Japan that goes through the Arctic and not through the Panama Canal. And uh, there's some industry people are kind of eager for that day because that would really shorten the time. Um, water has been seen at the North Pole. Uh, that uh, was uh, just in the past few years. Uh, that had never been seen before. Uh, sea level, again, something else we can measure. Uh, it's increased uh, somewhere between a half a foot and a foot uh, on average over the past uh, century. Extreme uh, rainfall events uh, have um, been noted uh, with a greater regularity uh, than in the past. A couple of years ago, there was a twister in Britain. Uh, they'd never seen one of those before. Of course, now everything gets blamed on, on global warming, right? Schwarzenegger gets elected governor and uh, it's global warming, right? I mean, we, we attribute everything to this now. Right? So you can't take anecdotal evidence too far, but we, we have actual measurements, right? And I would say we've landed people on the moon, so we could probably measure temperature pretty well. Um, so it's, it's real, at least in terms of our data, at least in terms of anecdotal evidence, okay? It doesn't mean necessarily that humans are the cause, right? We're just talking about warming talking about temperature, we're talking about climate change, and the data, the anecdotal evidence says yes, absolutely. So let's start there. Now, what do we know? Oh, I, I add another quote here. It's kind of interesting. Uh, this is another important point. Uh, since uh, 1976, uh, global surface temperatures have risen at a rate, at, the, at a century rate of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's per 100 years. Uh, that's 2 degrees Celsius uh, per century. Uh, that, that's the fastest that we could record if you go into ice cores and tree rings and all the things that people do to try to better understand uh, these things. That, that's a very fast change in temperature on global scales. Now, temperatures have risen significantly in the lower five miles of the atmosphere. This is the troposphere. But in the stratosphere, temperatures have decreased, ozone depletion. And I'll say more about that in a minute. So people talk about satellite data, and the reliability of satellite data and the relevance of satellite data for measuring temperature change, I got to be a little bit careful because the atmosphere isn't perfectly mixed. You've got the stratosphere and the troposphere, and there isn't much mixing between the two. So you can have cooling in one and warming in the other. And then how do you interpret a satellite image data? It's, it's, uh, it's difficult. Okay. Um, so I'll come back to why uh, we've got, and it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that. Uh, uh, ozone also has an absorption band uh, that can absorb heat. Okay, and we've seen uh, in the reactions that can absorb photons. Okay. So let's not ask if the Earth is getting warmer. Uh, you know, we're, it's interesting. We tend to be instant gratification oriented uh, more these days probably than at least in the history that I'm aware of. And um, certainly in the time scale of our observation in our lifetime, everyone in this room, uh, and beyond the generation before us, the Earth is getting warmer, right? So the question becomes why Earth is getting warmer and what role, if any, we're playing in it. So let's ask our second question. Do gases in the atmosphere trap heat radiated from Earth? Right? And I think everybody knows the answer to this one already. We don't have to go to Planck's law. That's something you probably saw back in Physics 101. Uh, but we should remind ourselves that the radiation frequency and distribution is related to the temperature of the body. We talk about a planet, we talk about a sun, okay? And the distribution of radiation, we talk about wavelength distribution, it's going to be a function of that temperature of the body. This is shown very clearly here on the left and on the right. We've got on the left-hand side here uh, sunlight and radiation emitted from the sun. Now, the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin in temperature on average. And if you remember Planck's law, basically there is a relationship between the wavelength of radiation that carries the maximum energy from that radiation. Okay, and that's basically 2,900 over the temperature in Kelvin. That's shown here. Uh, lambda is the wavelength carrying the maximum energy. We've got 2,900 over the temperature in Kelvin. So 2,900 over 5,800, uh, that is about 0.5. The measurement's in microns. So we've got about 500 nanometers or 0.5 microns wavelength. That's where the maximum radiation 
is going to occur from the sun. Happens, of course, bond with green light. Some believe that grass is green for this reason. Uh, has to comes down to efficiency and, and these other things. At least it's co coincidental. Uh, but we're talking about green light, a 500 nanometer wavelength, where uh, the energy from the sun is a maximum. Okay, and we've got a distribution on both sides. Okay, and the, the distribution is a little bit harder uh, to calculate. Okay, and you can see also the intensity in watts per meter square. Okay, uh, instantaneously up there about 2,000 on average. The Earth, the, the energy uh, striking the Earth's surface has a flux or an intensity of about watt, uh, 300, 1,370 watts per meter square. Okay. So basically, hot, uh, what, what are called black bodies, uh, they um, emit radiation at low wavelengths. Cooler bodies, such as the Earth, Average surface temperature of the Earth is about 288 Kelvin. So if we take about 2,900 over about 290, that's 10 microns. So the wavelength of radiation emitted from Earth is going to be a lot longer. The maximum is going to occur at about 10, and that's what's shown here. Okay. So there's not much overlap between what there is in terms of incoming radiation wavelengths from the sun and outgoing wavelengths emitted from the earth right longer wavelength radiation infrared radiation uh, from the earth okay now this is important uh, because we're going to talk now about a slide you've seen before i think we had this in the first session okay remember it's not only carbon dioxide ozone nitrous oxide methane and cfc's that are greenhouse gases but our most important one uh, is water vapor, right, clouds. And you can see here large absorption bands in the range of wavelengths emitted from the Earth. Again, with the analogy, on a cloudy winter night, the surface temperature is warmer than on a clear winter night. Right? And for this reason, you've got the absorption of infrared radiation in the clouds and the re-radiation back to Earth. So it comes down to absorption bands. Right, and we talk about things that are observable. I'll go back to the comment that was made. Right, is this really a complicated issue? Uh, has anybody here ever used a spectrophotometer? Maybe not. If there were some chemical engineers in here, they would say yes. This is something that <coughs> pretty much standard fare in terms of laboratory equipment. Um, I did a lot of work with uh, spectrophotometers in graduate school. Uh, we can measure these absorption bands very easily. Uh, this is Chem 101. This is something you can do in high school. So you talk about complicated phenomena. Is this really a complicated phenomena to measure the fact that gases in the atmosphere will absorb and re-radiate heat? Not really. It may be a little bit less intuitive to observe, but complicated in the things that you know, we have all around us, televisions, computers, rocket ships, and, and the like, uh, it's not complicated at all. Okay, this is quite easy to measure, and we know it from experience. We look back. Um, clouds, of course, can reflect sunlight back to Earth. That's a different mechanism. Uh, but we don't see nearly as much absorption of incoming radiation from the sun. Okay. And we could talk about carbon dioxide. You see carbon dioxide has bands uh, in that same zone, okay. in the infrared zone where the Earth um, radiates uh, heat energy. So we should expect carbon dioxide uh, to be a greenhouse gas, and it is, and it's been measured. And you know, there are measurements and calculations. As a celestial body, the average surface temperature of the Earth should be about minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, on average, it's about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. A small difference in terms of celestial calculations, right? that could be seen as a small error, but in terms of life on Earth, it's all the difference. right? ice versus water, and et cetera. Okay. Uh, so we can talk about these absorption bands. And again, this is in the realm of science. It's not in, in the realm of anything we don't understand. Okay. And if we extend that picture further, okay, this is uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide. Now we're including methane. We're including oxygen and ozone. 
and you see here a strong absorption band of ozone right in the center of that infrared spectrum. Nitrous oxide, we'll talk more about uh, from the oceans, from agriculture processes, uh, rainforest clearing. If you sum it all up, you see a large percentage of this outgoing infrared radiation being absorbed and re-radiated, a fraction of which is going to reach the surface again. Now, some, of it, some of it will be re-radiated back into space, but some of it will go back to the, to the Earth's surface. And much less by way of absorption on the incoming wavelengths. And I suppose that's a good thing because we like the planet to be warm instead of being cold. Okay. Here's ozone. Ozone depletion, while it's not good for protection from UV radiation, uh, it is good to counteract global warming. Right? So you can destroy ozone and cool the planet. Right? I guess this could be one solution, uh, perhaps not the best. And uh, could it really have uh, an offsetting effect given the concentrations of greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere? Maybe, maybe not. We'll talk about quantities and fluxes of carbon entering the atmosphere uh, in just a few minutes. Okay. Something else to mention while we're still talking about things we know and not things we're speculating about, uh, the planet Venus uh, is very hot. Uh, talk about the surface of Venus. It's about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, yes, Venus is closer to the sun. In fact, the solar flux reaching the um, planet Venus is about twice that of Earth. Okay, so we talked about 1,370 watts per meter square reaching the surface of the Earth, or let's say the outer atmosphere of the Earth. About twice that reaches Venus. Venus is particularly more cloudy than Earth. Uh, the albedo, which is the reflectivity of the atmosphere, is about 76%. That means about 76% of the radiation that reaches the top of the atmosphere is going to get re-radiated uh, directly back out in space. It won't touch a surface at all. The albedo of the, uh, the United States, the Earth, uh, some believe they're the same thing. Uh, I don't. Uh, it's about 31%. Okay. So the point here is actually less energy from the sun reaches the surface of Venus than reaches the surface of the Earth. Okay. That's the point, even though it's closer to the sun. But yet the temperature of Venus is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. On average, and here it's about on Earth, it's about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? The atmosphere is what makes the difference. The atmosphere of Venus is about 97% carbon dioxide. So what's being trapped, or I'm sorry, being re-radiated from Venus now is being largely trapped by the atmosphere right, and sent right back to the surface. And if we talk about Venus being hotter, and we go back to the slides here, we see here uh, carbon dioxide, again, 97% of the atmosphere. It's uh, less than 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, you'll see that this uh, distribution will shift a little bit left, right? And you see very strong absorption band here of CO2 okay, from the hotter uh, Venus. Okay. Again, these are things we've been to Venus. Well, not you and me personally, but we've sent uh, spaceships there. Uh, it's a place we understand relatively well, at least well enough to be able to uh, say it's consistent with things we know about our planet. Okay. Uh, so we're going to begin to graduate from the things we know into the things we don't know, okay, and the things that we probably won't be able to prove in, in our lifetime. Okay, we can only learn by experiment, by doing. Uh, we talk about the Earth's climate. Question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Like a uh, long, long time ago, like a uh, dinosaur walking around on the Earth everywhere, uh -huh. maybe temp temperature is more higher than now. Uh -huh. um, was it cloudy every day? Correlation and, and causation uh, it cannot be correlated with, or it cannot be you know, taken as sort of fact, right? Some people have gone back and tried to say, well, is it cloudier or is there more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And if so, where did that carbon dioxide go? And all of this people believe they understand there are correlations. Uh, other people will refute those correlations. 
if we want to stick in the world of facts, uh, we can't go back. Uh, we'll never be certain about what was going on 65 million years ago. Uh, but on current trends, we'll be at those temperatures really soon. And what we do know is that temperature fluctuations back then, uh, even though times were very hot, um, they didn't change very quickly. They didn't change in a century, um, in uh, five centuries. Uh, they were changing over much longer periods of time. And these are things that we can measure much more uh, directly. But why really the climate was different and what happened to the dinosaurs, so people believe it's an asteroid uh, that changed the, the surface. Now you've got more reflectivity, more particles in the atmosphere. We'll talk about the negative forcing that is caused by particles in the atmosphere and cloud formation caused by particles in the atmosphere, because uh, clouds can cool also. Is that we don't really know much about clouds at the end of the day. Uh, they can reflect sunlight back into space. They can uh, re-radiate uh, energy back to Earth. So at night, it should be pretty clear what's going on when you've got more clouds in the sky. But there are temperature effects, too. So you've got more temperature in the atmosphere. It can hold more water. So does it really get more cloudy? Uh, these are things that are just really hard to prove. So uh, I don't know. I don't believe anybody knows. Uh, I've read quite a bit about this issue, a number of books on it. And people have made those types of speculations. Maybe it was cloudy, or maybe there was more CO2. I haven't seen anybody, uh, to, to my satisfaction, prove it one way or the other. Uh, so I'll just say I don't know. But yeah, something was different about the climate, what it was. Or maybe it was the dinosaurs themselves. I don't know. But we, it, it really speaks to the the question, the third question, right, that we have to spend the majority of our time on. Right, does human activity contribute to global warming? Right, is, is what we're doing a factor in the warming that we're seeing? Right, because, um, you know, we can get into all sorts of uncertainties. Uncertainty is a, a big part of this, right? And again, we cannot prove it. So let's just put that issue aside. We can't make another Earth. Uh, so let's look at the evidence that we have. Uh, what I would call the best scientific evidence of the day, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, our own National Academy of Sciences, our own Environmental Protection Agency, whether led by a Democratic uh, administration or a Republican administration, everyone is basically singing the same song on this one. Uh, there are some, and there are a, a loud minority, a very uh, small minority of people uh, who are basically saying that they're poking holes in the evidence. And I don't think it's hard to poke holes in the evidence and to create skepticism. It's not hard to do. Uh, again, we can't prove this. So let's put that aside. Uh, but one thing that has to be noted, and we're going to talk about over the last 150 years, models that people have made of climate here in the U.S. Or, I'm sorry, here on Earth. Um, there isn't a very good alternative hypothesis, right? I mean, you could talk about the problems with the data, and there are problems with the data. And nobody should be overselling uh, the data that exists, because it isn't perfect. Um, I would, and I don't know, that, did anybody follow this exchange? Uh, anybody read The Skeptical Environmentalist? Uh, Lumberg's book, right? Uh, this book has been uh, chastised by environmentalists. Uh, Lomberg has been uh, excommunicated from the environmental community. He used to be an activist. Um, there was an exchange in Scientific American. Um, as an uh, engineer myself, as a professor myself, reading that exchange on both sides, I was embarrassed. Um, the fact that um, you know, one can, s on both sides of the issue, selectively take evidence, boost up evidence where it's not very good, or selectively choose evidence where it's bad, not taking it in its whole. Uh, this is probably equally guilty on both sides. I was especially disappointed with some of the climate scientists here in the United States who wrote the response to Lomberg's ar article. Because uh, it boiled down to, well, where was this guy in the, uh, in, in the conferences on atmospheric climate change? I'll come back in just a minute. Um, you know, is this really an appropriate way to respond? Right? I think we have to admit that our data is not perfect uh, and that we cannot prove this issue. I mean, the best, uh, you know, the IPCC is only coming around now and admitting the fact that we can't prove this in a scientific uh, impact. We're going to look at lots of, of data here in, in just a moment, okay? And you can argue with 
all of it, right, to some degree. So we have to begin putting error bars on things, and that's something we're just beginning to learn how to do. Uh, we need to look at both positive forcings and negative forcings. We'll define a forcing here in just a minute. Now people are beginning to do that. And what we're seeing is that the more we're learning about both, let's say, impacts that would warm the climate and impacts that would cool the climate, that our ability to explain the recent past, the past 100 and 150 years, is getting better. Okay. And when you, know, you look at, the, and I've been talking about climate change in, in classes like this for about 10 years now, uh, the, the evidence has gotten much, much stronger uh, than, than it used to be. And we're going to go through that here in just a minute. Question or comment? I just didn't know anything about that book or about the exchange in science of America. So, so I would encourage everybody to go and look at it. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's a long book. It's one that, uh, given reading uh, both sides, the Scientific American, and uh, Lomberg's book is about 250 pages. And again, I, you know, I, I will state my own disappointment with the environmental side of this issue, because I, I hear a lot of, especially student groups and activists and, and people who really care about this issue, just uh, going off on Lomberg in the book, and a, a lot of them, a fraction of people I ask, a majority of people I ask, haven't even read it. Um, one of the major issues, and I don't advocate uh, most of the stances he takes, and I don't want to say I'm doing that. Uh, but the point there is that, uh, the, and the point he's making is that you have to make priorities with respect to environmental decisions. And that's the central thesis in the book. It gets clouded with a lot of uh, selectivity and arguments uh, that goes just way too far. And you know, as a scientist, you know, he should be discredited. But, um, and he's not a scientist, he's just an economist. But um, the fact that at some level we have to decide between how we prioritize climate change, air pollution, water pollution, solid waste. That is a, a major point in the book uh, that gets overlooked. And it's one that a lot of environmentalists, uh, again, and I would consider myself an environmentalist, but the stereotype environmentalists, uh, you know, haven't really come to grips with. Right? The fact that you can't have everything designed, and everything's about design, uh, comes down to trade-offs, not just between environment, performance, safety, but even within environmental variables. We have to face that reality. And we haven't as a nation, as an international community yet. I think other countries have done a better job than the United States in terms of prioritizing um, these environmental issues. But I would challenge people you know, to, again, put the politics aside. We want to take sides naturally. Right? We want to have labels. We want that information just instantly provided to us. We want to associate with camps in general, because that's an easy thing to do. Time is short. We don't have time to read. We don't have time to look into these issues. You know, I would challenge everybody not to get sucked into arguments. Right? Just, just, you know, just take what you know and admit what you don't know. Uh, that's the mark of a, of a true scientist. And, um, you know, and, and, and the environmental issue is urgent. And it's, it's very easy. I heard a friend from MIT, uh, Tim Gutowski, uh, he's the associate chair over there in uh, mechanical engineering. He's been doing more and more work in environmental issues these days. He said it's very easy in the environment and being in environmental issues to get into things you just have no idea about. Right? And people, especially when you get high up in academic ladders, uh, they don't want to admit that there are certain things they don't know because it sort of takes a bit of an ego to get through the system in the first place. And um, yeah, so th therefore, the environment issue is, is quite dangerous. And there are a lot of things we don't know. And uh, the more we know, we find out, the more we don't know. Right? But that's, a, to some degree, a sign of wisdom. So let's carefully go through the data as it's been. And we're going to take the IPCC. Uh, you know, this is sort of the 50 million Frenchman argument. Right? They can't be wrong. You know, the bunch of scientists can't be wrong. Uh, we don't know. But a lot of the things make intuitive sense. And if there were an argument that really made intuitive sense on the other side of it, of this issue, I would present it in a heartbeat, right? But um, I, I've read the books, uh, Skeptical Environmentalist, a book called Global Warming, uh, Eco-Terrorism, you know, books bashing Al Gore and the like. Uh, I read them just for fun. I'm looking for that argument on the other side to present because I really sort of feel unbalanced. Uh, but again, we're getting into the realm of you know, what carbon dioxide does 
uh, absorbing radiation and re-radiating it back. I and mean, these are measurements that we can very easily make. Uh, we've got measurements of other planets. We've got measurements of gas. We've got models doing a good job in terms of predicting the last 150 years and our temperature measurements. Uh, so I, I just don't see anything with that level of fidelity and that level of quality out there, uh, by my own estimation. So you are not in this class. Uh, you can hold whatever opinion you want. You can say it's a myth, it's a hoax, uh, it's real, it's not real, whatever you want. Uh, but what we will hold you accountable for is what IPCC has presented okay, as their uh, data, their modeling, uh, their view of this approach, because this is the only internationally agreed upon um, uh, understanding of this issue. I think there was another comment or question. Yeah, I'm, despite it maybe not being less uh, more complicated, I have trouble getting my head around this issue. And um, I feel like there's, I can't think of a form of pollution that only contributes to global warming and does not contribute to some other form of pollution that's much easier for me to understand. And I just, wonder why people spend so much time focusing on this issue where there are very much more understandable issues that would have the same redu you know, reduction yeah, in sure. pollution. So why not focus on the more observable aspects? Carbon yeah. dioxide. Yeah. Let me try to turn this around. Uh, what's the harm in carbon dioxide emissions? If you were in a room full of carbon dioxide, you couldn't breathe. But even at current emission rates, we're not going to snuff out the oxygen in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a fertilizer for plants. It will, they will grow faster. We like plants. So what's wrong with carbon dioxide? That's a big part of the problem with this issue. Because that's it. We'll look at the, for, the forcings. If we look at the radiative forcing, we haven't defined forcings yet, but basically this is an upset in the balance of the uh, radiation that the atmosphere absorbs versus re-radiates back into the um, space. And of the forcings that we understand since 1850, about 64% of the positive forcings leading to these temperature increases that we've observed uh, are from carbon dioxide. So it's a big part of the problem, and we're all part of the problem, right? That which everyone owns, no one owns. You've heard that management expression. You've all worked on teams, right? Big teams don't work, right? Carbon dioxide is the biggest team you can imagine because we're all responsible. It doesn't matter what country you live in. Right? You, whether you're burning biomass or you're, you're burning... Uh, you're burning um, petroleum, right? Well, that's not quite right, because if you burn biomass, it's a net zero, because, of course, that carbon came from somewhere. It came from the atmosphere, whatever you're burning, right? But uh, we could talk about fluxes. Uh, but to some degree, you're part of the problem. You burn petroleum, right? coal, right? Talked about these things. Okay, so let's get into the, some of the modeling, so it will help our discussion along a little bit. But you have to recognize there isn't a talk about is. Uh, there's no absolute proof. Uh, so let's not pretend to know more than we know. Uh, let's actually take it to the board here and define this issue of forcing. Okay, what do we mean by forcing? And we're going to get a little bit quantitative here. Okay, a forcing is a change in the balance of incoming and outgoing radiation in the atmosphere. So I still say a change in the balance. You notice we've talked a lot about balance these days because things have certain tendencies to go in both directions. Uh, and we're, again, we're talking about balance here. Change in the balance of incoming and outgoing radiation, and this is mostly heat radiation, in the atmosphere. And we need to, and we're going to talk about delta Fs. F is for forcing. Because a forcing is going to be relative to some baseline balance, right? You have to define it at some point. Uh, we'll define it as 1850. Uh, around the time the Industrial Revolution really started taking off. Okay. But uh, we're talking about balance, so we're talking about change perturbation from some baseline. Well, we, that's why we use the delta F for the forcing. And it's 
and the same goes for heats, the change in the heat absorbed minus the change in the heat radiated back out into space. So if the Earth's albedo or reflectivity increases, we have more clouds, uh, this term will increase and the forcing will go down, it could go negative. Glaciers are melting. Glaciers melt, the reflectivity goes down, not up, goes down. Glaciers reflect energy back out into space. Right? So then this would be a negative term. Okay. The absorption. We talk about carbon dioxide or that ozone band or nitrous oxide, methane, CFCs. Right? These are generally positive change in the balance. More absorption of heat in the atmosphere. Okay, so that will increase this term. Okay, so we could talk about negative forcings and we can talk about positive forcings. We have to talk about both. We can talk about direct forcings. We can talk about indirect forcings. Okay, so let's give uh, some examples of each of these. Okay, so we talk about, uh, for instance, a negative forcing. Okay, this would be clouds that reflect energy back out into space. That would tend to cool the Earth. Okay, a positive forcing would be, for instance, carbon dioxide or the other gases we talked about, water vapor even, right? warming up the surface of the Earth. A direct forcing, we could talk about, just to use another example, uh, particles from a volcano. Right? Mount Pinatubo in the early 90s erupted and affected climate for a number of years in the early 90s. You can actually observe it in the temperature data. And those particles directly um, reflect energy back out into space, cooling down the Earth. So that would be a direct negative forcing. Uh, we could talk about an indirect forcing from those same particles because those same particles can seed clouds. Right? So that would be an indirect uh, negative forcing if those clouds are reflecting uh, energy back out into space. So we've talked about clouds warming up and cooling down the Earth. So you might be wondering what's the net impact of clouds. We don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, it's, some, it's near... It's near a wash. We'll go through the table uh, that uh, IPCC put out. Uh, but the confidence on clouds is very low. The confidence on carbon dioxide is very high. So confidence is another issue that, that we need to be talking about here. Okay? So we've got direct, indirect, positive, and negative forcings to consider. So yes, the issue, I'll go back to use the word that was used earlier, may be complicated. Right? Okay. Um, now, another definition here, as long as we're being quantitative, is called the climate sensitivity parameter. Sensitivity. And we give this the same Greek letter as we give to wavelength, that's lambda. Okay, climate sensitivity parameter, defines the relationship between a forcing and the average surface temperature on Earth. Okay, so this describes the relationship between the change in forcing And whenever I say forcing, just because I know I'm going to do this a lot, I'm really talking about the change in forcing relative to a baseline. Change in forcing. And the average surface temperature. And believe it or not, as difficult as this sounds to do. Uh, we've had satellites up in space trying to figure out what lambda is. Okay? And the best estimate, again, estimates that have been uh, endorsed as the best available, uh, not only by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but our own National Academy of Sciences, uh, is uh, 0 0.546 degrees Celsius per watt 
per meter square. And I should mention that the units on forcing is watts per meter square, the same as the units of flux from the sun reaching Earth. I remember 1370 watts per meter square. We talk about solar energy and the potential of solar energy. Uh, we get 1370 watts per meter square from the sun. All right, if 30% is reflected back, right, we can calculate uh, the forcing from that. Right? Um, the units are the same, watts per meter square. Okay? So we have degrees C per watt per meter square. Uh, do we know this perfectly? I doubt it. There's not only difficulty in measuring the uh, climate sensitivity parameter, okay, but there's also uncertainty in terms of the feedback loop. Right? I mean, we can look at how uh, the forcing in the atmosphere has changed using satellites, and we can measure, you know, fit some data, and see how the average surface temperature of the Earth has changed. We fit the model, and we can get a number like 0.546, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that we fully understand the feedback loops. So suppose that the forcing goes up. No, let's just use that the forcing goes up by one watt per meter squared, just to keep this easy. Now we multiply it by lambda, it's about 0.5. Okay, so that means that the average surface temperature should increase by roughly half a degree Celsius. Right. But what happens? Right? Roughly one degree Fahrenheit. Right? Maybe it's going to get more cloudy, right? and there are four things we don't right, in terms of the indirect effects. So they have bounded this, uh, and, and it's the feedback mechanisms that we really don't understand. People are working very hard uh, to better understand these issues. But you're going to see a large uncertainty range from 0 0.34 to about 1.03. All right, so you start asking, what's the impact here? I mean, this is quite large in terms of uncertainty. Right. But one thing to note is it's not symmetric, right? The uncertainty is much more on the warm side than on the, the cool side. I'm not sure anybody else has made that observation before. At least I haven't read it, but it, that's always made me a bit curious. Now, why? If it's wrong, it's more likely to be wrong on the, the wrong side of zero. I think there was a question. Um, if the forcing, say, goes up by some bit, do we instantly see an increase in temperature, or there's also like some time delay mechanisms? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, the fit to the model would be instantaneous, right? Is that really the, the case? I, it's not realistic to believe it is the case, right? These are temperature uh, observations made over decades and then model fitting. So it's all averaged out over some time period, probably on the order of decades. But we're talking on the order of decades, right? We're talking about, and we're going to talk about the carbon cycle probably beginning on Friday. But if we emit a kilogram of carbon dioxide today, um, about 20 kilogram, I'm sorry, 0 0.2 kilograms, 200 grams, 20% of that emission will still be in the atmosphere in 500 years. And some believe that that number is closer to 30 or 40%. And we'll talk about the carbon cycle and why that is. Right? So that's perfectly fine. Right? It doesn't necessarily matter today. And there's going to be a lot of other local things going on anyway. You could have Mount Pinatubo erupting. Right? And that'll you know, cool things down for a good few years right? in the meantime. Other questions? We'll go back to the slides here and, and take a look at the radiative forcing estimates for greenhouse gas constituents since 1850. Okay, and that's shown here. Uh, basically, this might be a little bit tough for you to see in class, but um, you've got here in the left-hand column uh, the radiative forcings for certain greenhouse gases. You've got indirect greenhouse gases, direct aerosols, indirect aerosols, and the sun itself. All right, this is part of the things that people will do to confuse the public and confuse otherwise interested parties, right? The sun changes too, right? Who knows? Maybe 65 million years ago, the sun got really hot. Right? How would we really know? Um, I don't want to go there to find out. But, um, you know, there are, you know, solar variations also that are shown on this table. So we go through here, 
this forcing is not only the potency of the gas, right? Certain gases, as we've already looked at, have different absorption bands than others. So some will be more potent in terms of the global warming potential on a per mass basis. For instance, if I remember correctly, the, and we'll have the table later, uh, probably Friday, uh, the global warming potential of methane is about 56 times that of carbon dioxide. So methane is a more potent greenhouse gas on a per mass basis. But there's much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and much more being released to the atmosphere. So you see here the forcing since 1850 of carbon dioxide is higher. So if we use roughly 0.5 as our climate sensitivity parameter, we got about 1.5, you could attribute a positive increase in the average surface temperature of the Earth to carbon dioxide, it's about 0.75 degrees C. Okay. This issue is not that simple, but these are the estimates right, that come, come out at the end. Methane, where's methane come from? We'll, we'll talk more about this later. What about methane? I got an email from a student off campus, and he said, uh, I saw this big torch coming out of a landfill on the way to work this morning. Why aren't we using that energy? And that's methane. Decomposition right, of um, solid waste, of um, domestic waste, sewage, uh, anaerobic breakdown of organic matter, generally the pathway. Uh, it's it's uh, methanogeneration what it's called, um, produces methane. Okay, that's why some landfills have exploded before. They build up this gas. Uh, some places use that energy. Uh, apparently that place, you know, and you see that, you have to off-gas it or else it, it will explode. Okay, so there is some methane from decomposition. There are also other sources of methane. Halocarbons, we've talked about, CFCs. Uh, they are not only when they dissociate, uh, they lead to ozone depletion. But before they dissociate, they uh, are a positive force. Right? And they're much more potent glo green, I'm sorry, in terms of their global warming potential. The halocarbons are in the thousands. If we go on a per mass basis relative to carbon dioxide, they're much more potent. But instead of talking about parts per million of, like we would with carbon dioxide, we're talking now parts per trillion, parts per billion of CFCs and, and halocarbons, thank goodness. So that forcing is relatively low. Okay, but 0.28 is still significant. Nitrous oxide uh, from rainforest cleaning we already mentioned. Our confidence level on these is pretty good. These are well mixed gases in the atmosphere. They are things we can measure. They're things we can look at in the lab. The confidence is high. Okay, and it's positive. 2.45 if you add it all up. Okay. Where we're less sure is with respect to the indirect effects. We can talk about ozone, stratospheric ozone. You deplete it, get rid of that absorption band, the stratosphere will cool, and that will trickle down to the troposphere. You have smog. Remember the primary constituent of smog is ozone, and it was going to uh, lead to an increased forcing. So you see it's a lot higher. Right? The reason for this is it's a lot closer to the ground. Right? And you need sunlight and heat to actually create that. Remember the, the, the soup of photochemical smog being driven by sunlight. So temperature is there. It's just going to heat up more right? in that, that production. Right? And this is measured over cities, which sort of create their own weather. Right? And there's a lot of concrete there. So you, you can see that the, the confidence begins to wane quickly even in the stratosphere, because these are dynamic equations. Ozone is not mixed evenly across the globe, as you've seen. Right? So our confidence begins to shrink. But even with low confidence, you know, it's not believed that the magnitudes are large relative to 2.45. We could talk about aerosols, right? acid rain producing particles, sulfate. Right? One of the if, if you look at, um, you know, go back about 10 years, uh, maybe 1993, 1994, when we had less understanding, you had climate scientists trying to predict the temperature record 
of the last 150 years. And their models, based on these forcings, uh, were over-predicting the temperature. They basically were saying, we should be seeing a lot more warming than we have seen over the last 150 years. And they didn't know why. Uh, then they started looking at aerosols, at particles, sulfate particles in particular, right? Uh, from volcanoes, from uh, power plant emissions, and the like. Sulfate can be a nucleus for cloud formation and therefore can serve to cool by re-radiating uh, light. And, and, and we're talking here uh, not as a, a direct cloud formation, but even as the particles themselves. So these nuclei themselves can reflect energy back out into space. They can also, and we, we have down here the indirect aerosols, right, if they were to lead to cloud formation, right, also cooling the Earth, maybe a net negative. But you can see our confidence is getting lower and lower because these are harder and harder to measure. And they're not globally homogenous. They're locally homogenous, right, and barely that. So how does this combine into a patchwork to lead to something like average global surface temperature? That's, that's tough, right? The Japanese right now are trying to build a, a computer uh, that can do a good job as a finite element model of the Earth to better represent climate and potential climate change, right? But even there, the element sizes are going to be relatively large on the scale of cities, right? So that you, you get into some things that are difficult to measure. Uh, but when you talk about indirect aerosols, you could be getting into the realm. Cloud cover, that there, it could be enough energy reflected back into space to start to offset that 2.45, you see it. Uh, still not quite enough. Um, glaciers melting, that's not shown here, right? That would offset that reflectivity issue. Um, and a lot of people talk about clouds, but we don't understand clouds, therefore we don't know anything about this climate change issue. So why are we taking it seriously? My argument would be, why do you want clouds? Right? I mean, it's depressing enough around here about this time of year when the sun goes away. Right? You want to leave that for the next generation? You want that to be your legacy? I wouldn't feel very good about it. But um, it's where we're heading, perhaps. So it's, it's a little bit grim, but we'll start getting into uh, the calculation. On, on Friday. And, and now this, you know, the engineers in the room will appreciate a little bit more, so we'll start doing some problems, okay? So we can now admit, uh, we'll look at a few problems like, um, you know, what is the uh, climate change associated with all U.S. Mission emissions from 1980 to um, 1990? So what's the expected change in average Earth's surface temperature? Uh, if you have a good scientific calculator, uh, you can calculate your own impact using these types of uh, equations. Of course, they're just estimates. Uh, but in the end, you can start to see how they accumulate into real uh, numbers and real tangible issues. Okay, so that's where we're going on Friday. And um, again, after that, we'll start uh, talking about eco design. So have a good day in between. And we finished up talking about forcings uh, and climate sensitivity. And if we take it to the slides here, just as we get going, uh, we'll remind ourselves of a slide that we saw early on in the semester. This is the uh, concentration increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that have been measured uh, since roughly, I think, 1870 is what's shown uh, up there. Uh, just by way of reminder, uh, why do we care about this plot? Uh, what is it about CO2 in particular uh, that's uh, uh, unique? Anyone? Greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect, and what about it? What about CO2 relative to other greenhouse gases that might be in the atmosphere? What did we talk about last time? It's present in the atmosphere in larger concentrations. In larger concentrations, and this is something on campus here that you can't see very easily, but we're in the parts per million, which is quite a lot, actually. Uh, you know, roughly uh, you know, half percent in that type of range of the atmosphere. Uh, it, it's quite a high concentration. When we talk about, say, nitrous oxide or uh, methane, we're down in the parts per billion uh, range. And we talk about CFCs, we're in the parts per trillion uh, in the atmosphere. So uh, that's one unique aspect of CO2. Now, what makes it a greenhouse gas? We talked about this on Wednesday. 
Is it that somebody picked it to be one, or uh, was it, what is it about the physics of CO2, or the chemistry of CO2? There was a key slide, right? We talked about the absorption bands, yeah. right? And that's related to the chemistry. It's related to the molecular bonds of CO2, and it resonates essentially at different wavelengths, absorbing radiation and re-radiating that back to the surface. And carbon dioxide had some absorption bands in that critical set of wavelengths, in the infrared set of wavelengths, where Earth re-radiates energy back to space. Remember, hot uh, bodies like the sun uh, emit low frequency, or I should say high frequency, low wavelength radiation, right, down in the UV range, roughly uh, maximum at uh, green light or greenish yellow light, 500 nanometers we talked about. And we're much higher in the spectrum. We talk about what the heat radiation uh, that's re-radiated from the Earth. And carbon dioxide absorbs that, re-radiates it back to the Earth. So carbon dioxide and increases in carbon dioxide concentration are therefore quite important. And we'll see when we break down the radiative forcing since 1850 that carbon dioxide is the, the, the major player, uh, roughly 64% of the forcing that we can attribute. So um, now getting into a little bit of, of quantitative matter, uh, as we, we look at the board now, um, we have to remember that the impact of increases in concentration, uh, as we saw on the slide, uh, is going to be related basically to two factors. Number one is what is the concentration of the gas in the atmosphere. And generally, more uh, higher concentration in the atmosphere, higher impact on um, global warming. Okay. Now, this isn't necessarily a linear relationship, and we'll see that later in class today. The second parameter is how strong of a greenhouse gas is it? Okay. Does it have secondary effects? And uh, to, you know, where in the absorption bands uh, does that gas lie? Okay. So there are two factors that are driving it. And we're going to define something called green, uh, I'm sorry, global warming potential. Uh, this is something you may have heard of before, the global warming potential of uh, emission A versus the global warming potential of emission B. Uh, this is often used in political discussions, in particular political discussions related to the Kyoto Protocol uh, and cutbacks versus 1990 levels when we talk about getting global warming potential down 7, 10 percent redu reduction of emissions. Um, we're often talking about a baseline relative to CO2. So I'm actually doing the presentation of this material a little different than I did it last year. Uh, in your reading, you're going to see in the course pack a lot of discussion about global warming potential. Before we get there, I want to define something called non-normalized global warming potential, and hopefully you'll understand better uh, where global warming potential uh, comes from. So let's uh, start by defining something called the uh, non-normalized uh, global warming potential. All right, and we talk about global warming potentials being GWP. Okay, so I'm just going to put N2. N2 is for non-normalized global warming potential. Okay. Now, uh, we will define this as being an integral over time. Uh, for instance, if I emit a kilogram of carbon dioxide today, if in, and that makes it into the atmosphere, uh, that will decay over time. Okay. Now, how would I define global warming potential? Should I be looking at some point T in the future? Like what's the remaining impact of that emission in 20 years or 100 years or 500 years? Or should I integrate that impact over time? That's just a decision. It's a metric that people use. In this case, uh, for global warming potential, people look at the cumulative impact. So they'll integrate from time zero to time T. So that's the first sort of concept here. We've already said that uh, the forcing matters. 
And we know that the relationship between forcing and average, uh, it's called a change in forcing, to the average surface temperature increase is defined by a parameter lambda, which is the climate sensitivity parameter. It's also related to the concentration of the gas, R sub G. And that's a function of time, right? Because the concentration decays with time. And we finish off the integral with dt. It's an integral over time. Let's use this as our definition of non-normalized global warming potential. Remember, lambda is the climate sensitivity factor. Delta F is the change in forcing relative to a baseline. And I suppose I should define the units here. This is watts per meter squared. And this is degrees Celsius per watt per meter squared. A little tough to read. Degrees Celsius per watt per meter squared. So when I multiply lambda and delta F, then I get degrees C. Rg of T is the concentration of the gas at time T. And generally, we're talking about a fraction here. So it doesn't have units. So it's how much of one kilogram is remaining at time T. So let me just make sure we understand that. How much of one kilogram is remaining at T? How can we use this in decision making? Okay. There are lots of gases out there that can contribute to global warming. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs, and many varieties of CFCs, and halons, HCFCs, etc. Uh, this can get confusing, especially given the fact that there is quite a bit of uncertainty. Remember, we've talked about the uncertainty range of lambda being somewhere between 0.3, right? So often what is done, and actually what is done in political circles especially, is to normalize the global warming potential of a gas to the global warming potential of CO2. For instance, imagine in five years that we learn more about the climate sensitivity parameter, right, lambda. Maybe we change it from 0.54 to 0.6 or down to 0.3, right? Now, all of these calculations, I mean, we could just keep track of non-normalized global warming potential, right? But that would get a little bit confusing as we better understand forcings, as we better understand lambda. So what is done is there is a normalization of the uh, gas to that uh, global warming potential of CO2. So when you see in the literature, in your, in your notes, global warming potential, what this really is, is the non-normalized global warming potential of the gas of interest over the non-normalized global warming potential of CO2. Okay, and now we'll just substitute the equations in. Okay, for the top, it's just the same as we defined. Integral from 0 to t, delta f, lambda, rg of t, dt. And in the denominator, same form, except now we're talking about the forcing of CO2, lambda, the decay of carbon dioxide with time, dt. Now, what happens here is that lambda, we're going to assume to be constant. We're also going to assume that the forcings are constant over time. And that may be an assumption that you question, 
and you should, and we'll come back to that later. Okay, but what that means in terms of the global warming potential equation is that since lambda is a constant and the same in the numerator and denominator, we can, we can cancel it. So that comes out of the equation. And we can pull delta F CO2 and delta FG outside of the integral. So we're left with delta F sub G over delta F sub CO2, so it's a ratio of the forcings, times the ratio of the integral of the decay over time. So we've got the integral just of the decay of the gas over time, dt, over the integral from 0 to t of the decay of CO2 as a function of time. Now the forcings We've already seen tables that estimate the forcings for these gases. The only thing we don't know how to calculate right now is these integrals. Okay? And there are two key concepts here, uh, one for the numerator and one for the denominator. Uh, for all gases besides carbon dioxide, we are going to assume that the decay is uh, proportional uh, to the concentration. So this will, we'll assume first order kinetics again, as we've done before. And you're going to be left essentially with an exponential. So for all gases other than carbon dioxide, we have first order kinetics and exponential decay. That's the first concept. The second concept is for carbon dioxide. For carbon dioxide, we do not use exponential decay. And the reason for that is there is huge fluxes of carbon uh, between the atmosphere, uh, between uh, the soil, between vegetation, between the oceans, even between the oceans and the deep oceans, that would be ongoing uh, whether or not there were anthropogenic emissions of carbon to the atmosphere. In fact, what we're going to see is that the industrial and, and uh, let's say anthropogenic emissions of carbon to the atmosphere are relatively small compared to the fluxes of carbon in what is called the carbon cycle, in the natural carbon cycle. That does not mean that these emissions are unimportant. It means that they're relatively small and we can't assume first order kinetics. And we're going to have a slide here on the carbon cycle in just a second. But let's work through uh, the first order kinetics first. Okay, we'll go to the, the numerator here. And, and we've seen this, this logic uh, many times already in this class that um, we're making a, an assumption that the change in concentration, in this case of a gas, but well, we've done it for BOD, right? We've done it for settling. The change in concentration as a function of time is proportional to how much gas is there. Let me just use the proportionality symbol here. And we've solved this before. It's an exponential. So the simple solution is that Rg of t is e to the minus t over tau. And you might be wondering why there isn't an R naught in front of the exponential. And that's because we're assuming a fraction of one kilogram. All right, so essentially there's a 1 here. So Rg of t is the fraction of 1 kilogram remaining at time t. So it decays. Tau is the time constant, generally expressed in years. Okay. The time constant. Any questions about this? OK. So um, and of course, we can always multiply Rg of t by the emission quantity. So if I have 100 kilograms of CO2, then I would just multiply 100 times Rg of t. Right? So essentially, 100 gets put here as the initial condition. So this is just the fraction remaining. Well, we can now integrate the exponential. <coughs> 
right? This is something familiar to many of you. And if we were to just integrate this, we'd get tau 1 minus e to the t over tau. Okay. It's the integral of 0 to t. I guess I should be a little bit more precise. 0 to t, r g of t, dt. Right. Now that's the solution. And we'll often put a g here because we're talking about a particular gas. So this could be nitrous oxide. I believe the time constant for nitrous oxide is uh, around 110 years or something like that. So tau of NO, N2O would be about 110 years. Okay. So we can plug this directly into the numerator. OK, so let's do that. We get global warming potential now is equal to tau, I'm sorry, the ratio of the forcings times tau g, 1 minus e to the t over tau g. And we're left with the integral still for CO2 as a function of time. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. E to the minus T. minus t over tau sub g. Otherwise, it would be trouble. Um, how do you calculate the GWP for carbon dioxide? Oh, we're not there. Oh, OK. That's an explanation. OK, so then yeah, this is where it, it gets uh, even more interesting. Okay. So we have to talk about the carbon cycle. And I have here on the slides, and this will be a little tough in class. See. Uh, but you got in the notes too. Uh, these are the fluxes of carbon dioxide, or of carbon, sorry, in the uh, atmosphere, on the ground, in the oceans. Okay, and what you see here uh, are units of gigatons carbon. Okay, so a gigaton is about 10 to the 15th gram. And we see here stored in the atmosphere, almost all of what is as CO2, 750 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. OK, that's uh, quite a bit. Okay. Now there are fluxes between the, the ocean and the atmosphere, between land, plants, soil, decaying matter, and the atmosphere. OK, and these fluxes have been estimated. For instance, uh, we know that plants undergo photosynthesis, right? And as the uh, estimate goes, about 61.3 gigatons carbon goes, is soaked up from the atmosphere and uh, put into the terrestrial sphere. Okay. And we know there is decay of organic matter right around this time of year, especially the leaves decay. And that flux uh, is just under uh, 61, about 60 gigatons carbon. Okay. Um, I'll skip over to the oceans here. And these are natural processes, not anthropogenic processes. The um, oceans, uh, a large amount of carbon is stored in the oceans, much more than in the atmosphere. In fact, in the deep oceans, you're somewhere around 40,000 gigatons of carbon relative to about 1,000 in the atmosphere. All right, where is carbon in the oceans? How can we account for this? Maybe it's in coral? Yes, some fraction is in uh, marine. Uh, it could be uh, small organisms, uh, coral. Uh, that is uh, only a small amount. Oh, well, relatively small. It's actually on, on the order of the amount 
uh, three gigatons carbon. It's here, marine biota. Okay, so it's not huge, but it's on the order of the emissions from humans each year. I think I mentioned a couple times earlier in the term that we used to give a problem. Uh, what is the pH of very pure water? And the answer was 5.6 and not 7. And the reason for this is because if you have deionized water and you just stick it in a glass on a table in, in the room or in a lab, uh, it's going to soak up some carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It just comes from equilibrium kinetics. And there will be some absorption of carbon, and it will be stored as carbonate and bicarbonate. This is CO3 and HCO3. And that leads to the pH drop. Uh, slightly acidic, right? The, the, the pH of rain, if it's pure, it would be somewhere around 5.5 or 6, not 7. Okay. Now, much below 5.5, that's acid rain. The point here is the oceans have tremendous loads of carbonate and bicarbonate. And that's where this 40,000, roughly 40,000 gigatons carbon in the ocean is. But that uptake is relatively slow. Okay, and that's important to note uh, in, in just a few minutes here. Okay. But if we were just to add up the natural fluxes of carbon dioxide, let's call it carbon to be more general, between the land and the atmosphere and between the oceans and the atmosphere, we would find that there is a pretty good balance. Even though the fluxes are huge, the, the net is about zero. So even numbers on the order of 5.5 gigatons of carbon per year emitted from human sources can upset this balance significantly, right? And you saw the slide showing the increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you see here, even, in, and I'm showing it in this corner here, I'm circling it here, about 5.5 gigatons of carbon from fossil fuels and cement production happen to be the uh, two biggest sources of carbon from anthropogenic sources. That can upset the balance and lead to very high accumulations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Right? Even though it's a relatively small number relative to these fluxes. Okay. Uh, it's just energy intensive. And uh, it releases uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, but it's not a calcium carbonate per se uh, effect there. We should also note that changing land use can impact these fluxes. If we clear cut rainforests okay, uh, and burn biomass, if we have more agriculture, it turns out that uh, animals, right? Um, can lead to carbon emissions to the atmosphere, in particular methane. Um, it can impact these fluxes also. And we see, and, and this is shown over here, that there's a net increase in the amount of carbon in the atmosphere from changing land use. Okay. Uh, now, it turns out that we have a lot of regrowth of forests, especially here in the northern hemisphere in Europe and in the United States, Canada in particular, uh, where there was a lot of deforestation uh, and a lot of replanting of trees. And there happens to be more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the Earth is actually getting greener right now. And there's satellite images, uh, NASA uh, analysis basically showing over the last 20, 30 years uh, that the, in particular, the um, uh, northern and, and near equatorial uh, southern hemisphere are becoming very green. Uh, relative to what it was 20, uh, 30 years ago. We see some soaking up of carbon from the atmosphere, and that's about half a gigaton of carbon, as shown here. Okay. So uh, regrowth of forests. Uh, very mature forests don't soak up much carbon, but young forests do. Okay. So this, as you can see, is very complex. right? But it doesn't take much more, if you look at the exchanges between land, exchanges between the atmosphere and the ocean, it's about balance. And relative to that balance, relative to zero, 5.5 gigatons of carbon is a lot for the net associated with changing land use. That's a lot relative to zero. Uh, 
The exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean is only a net of, of two sinking to the ocean. And uh, the exchange, the natural exchange between the atmosphere and land is a net 1.3 to the land. Right, so six dwarfs you know, 3.3. So we've set the balance in the other direction. Question? If the ocean could, would it absorb more carbon? Yeah, so some people say, why not get the marine biota to do more of the job? Uh, these um, organisms in the upper layer of the ocean absorb quite a bit of carbon, as we see here. Now, relative to six, three is a lot, right? So uh, there are some individuals out there advocating trying to seed the oceans to get the catalyze basically more growth of marine biota to absorb more carbon. Typically, it is iron, the element iron, that is limiting their growth. So some have suggested to see the oceans with iron, iron filings, and I think there have been experiments to this life, just to see if it would work. Um, certainly, there would be a greater absorption of carbon. Uh, what the other effects of seeding the oceans, which are massive, with, car with iron and some of the energy it would take to do that uh, would be of concern to others. And there are, there are others still who believe that this would increase the amount of nitrous oxide emitted to the atmosphere and actually cause more harm than good. So it's a debate and it's currently being studied, this hypothesis. Question? These research, do they acknowledge that, I mean, if there's a fundamental problem and then you try and cover that up with something and then you try and counter back, back that with something else and something else, that you're sort of weaving this tangled web that if you just eliminated the problem in the first place, I mean, do people acknowledge that in the research or is that well, something you're that's quoting, You're quoting Shakespeare back there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tangled web we weave when it is our uh, goal to deceive, right, or something like that. Yeah. And Shakespeare said that. Um, well. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. Do they, at some level, would they agree with the statement, you know, it'd be better to prevent it? Probably they would. Uh, I don't know if this shows up in research papers or not. Uh, the fact is there's money to be made, right? I mean, if, and this has been sort of the, the evolution of humankind, right? It, it hasn't been, prevention doesn't come naturally. Now, instant gratification comes naturally. Uh, so, you know, we've, whenever we've come up against a barrier, right? We've tried to sort of work our way around it, right? And keep things chugging along. Uh, sometimes it's bit us. I mean, you can go into certain civilizations that have collapsed, right? Not you know, preventing problems and just trying to either ignore them or, or work their way around them, right? Sometimes solutions come, sometimes they don't. But, uh, you know, it brings up another point. I think it ties back into some of the discussion uh, from last Wednesday, right? Uh, some people say, well, you know, um, you know they, 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 there's a, a lot of confusion and discussion uh, related to this global warming issue. Uh, we've tried to present the issues as simply as possible. Uh, there, there's essentially, you know, there's money to be made in the research. I mean, certainly if we could just sequester the carbon and just chug along as we're going, right, and burn up all the coal, that would buy us some time to develop more renewable sources and in and, and a more sustainable path, right? So the, yeah, the research might be a good thing, right? Now, could this create other effects? You know, ozone hole, you know, we, we saw this happen before and we came up with benign solutions, caused other problems. Um, but just because, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss too, right? That, you know, when there's no counter argument to say that this would be a bad thing. Um, you know, the, the point is that, you know, prevention is cheaper, it works better, uh, but it's expensive, and it calls for sacrifice in the absence of proof. And people don't like that very much. So, uh, you know, I think anybody would agree with your statement. But, you know, when there's money to be made, uh, there's always, you know, another side appears. Right? Uh, and I'm going to come back to that point here in just a minute. So you ask, go back to the original question of our pirate. Okay, what, uh, how do we handle this... Uh, Denominator, right? Well, um, basically, oh, I, uh, let's go back to the slides because I have it, actually I have it here. Uh, these are estimates of the fraction of a kilogram of carbon remaining after a certain number of years. And what you've got here is terrestrial uptake of carbon, which is fast, 
occurring in the first few years of that emission, and then a much slower uptake by the ocean over time. And what should be pretty scary, this is scary to me anyway, uh, here's your one kilogram up here. Uh, after 500 years, even in a constant CO2 atmosphere assumed, you're left with about uh, 0.2 kilograms remaining. 20% of that emission is still there after 500 years, and that's in the best case scenario. The fact is we're headed to a double CO2 world and probably a four times CO2 world. So the uptake will slow even more because we're accelerating the amount of carbon dioxide that's there in the background. So the uptake is, is competing with other uptakes. And it could be up to 40% of that emission uh, remaining. Okay, so you ask where do we get the information regarding how much carbon dioxide is remaining in the atmosphere. It comes from this plot. These are estimates, again, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And what we need to do is integrate under one of these curves. And we're going to use the, the constant carbon model, even though we know that probably the increase in carbon model is better. Right, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Now, these estimates can be nearly a factor of two off. But we use it as a baseline, and we're doing some normalization anyway. Okay. So um, basically, we need to integrate under this curve. Uh, it's not a difficult thing to do. Solution I'll write up here on the board. So three cases, make a table. So a time horizon. Let's uh, look at 20 years, 100 years, and 500 years. And the integral from 0 to t, right, this is t, of r CO2 of t dt. For 20, it's 13.2. For 100, it's 43.1. And for 500, it's 138.0. Okay. We'll use these in the denominator. So you'll only ever be asked to calculate this integral for 20, 100, or 500 years. Okay. But that does not prevent you from, suppose I gave it a question on the homework or on an exam, how much carbon is related or is remaining in 75 years if I emit 100 kilograms of carbon dioxide now. Okay. Because you can calculate that from the chart back here on the slides. I would just go up to 75, it's about here, and then go up. And you'd have to assume either a constant carbon atmosphere or an increase in carbon atmosphere. Right? So that would be somewhere around 0.3 or 0.4. So of that 100 kilograms, if I was assuming an increasing carbon dioxide atmosphere, then about 40 kilograms would be remaining. Any questions here? We'll do some examples now. Okay, so um, here's a, an example, HFC 134A. Uh, this is being used as I'm sorry, refrigerant in air conditioning systems, especially in the auto industry. HFC 134A. Uh, let's look at the radiative forcing of that gas. Uh, it's about 4,129 times the forcing of one kilogram of CO2. So if we take the ratio of the forcings of HFC 134A to, uh, to CO2, uh, that ratio is 4,129. The decay of HFC 134A will assume is exponential with a time constant of 14.6 years. Calculate the 20 and 100 year global warming potentials. So to solve this problem, what we do is we go back to our equation for global warming potential here at the top of the board. The ratio of the forcings, right, for our example, is bringing it down, 4129 times the time constant for HFC 134A, which we said was uh, how many years? 14 years? 
of 14.6 years times 1 minus exponential. Yeah, let's uh, look at the, the 20 year, 100 year. Right? Uh, it's not a good way to do it. Let me just write the 20 year out. Over 14.6. So this is for the 20 year global warming potential over the integral from 0 to t of r c o 2 t dt. This integral, which is for 20 years, 13.2. Okay. And I think I have the answer here on the slides. All right. It's about 3,400. Okay. And for 100 years, it's about 1,300. All right. So here's a table of calculations. And we should talk about this because there's a lot of important details here. One, that CFCs and HCFCs and HFCs, methyl chloroform, carbon tetrachloride, these have very high global warming potential relative to CO2. And thank goodness because these are in the parts per trillion concentrations in the atmosphere, whereas carbon dioxide is in the parts per million range, as we discussed earlier. Right. You have the lifetimes here for these gases in this column, okay, and the, the relative forcing. And here is the global warming potential, again, at 20, 100, and 500 years. All right, the answer for HFC 134A is in the box. Now, it's interesting to note that if you look relative to the forcing, which we can sort of consider a time zero uh, global warming potential, we can, we can kind of think of it that way. At 20 years, most gases, especially ones that have long atmospheric lifetimes, right, they go up. So uh, if we look, you know, 120 years for nitrous oxide, the forcing is 206, the, r the ratio of the forcings is 206, but at 20 years, the global warming potential is actually 280. Okay. But as we go farther into time, it goes down again. The point is that, and, and we saw this back here, this curve for CO2 is relatively flat once we get out of the, the atmospheric uh, to terrestrial decay region here where it's relatively fast. We get into the oceanic uptake, which is relatively slow. This is not exponential out here. So other gases are going to decay faster out here in time when you get out to 100 and 500 years. Okay, and this is reflected in the table. All right, numbers tend to go up and then they go down between 20, 100, and 500 years. Okay. All of these gases have global warming potentials larger than one. That's another thing to note. Okay. Carbon dioxide, regardless of the time frame, is defined. Uh, that's, that's what's being normalized to. Uh, it will, you know, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide at 20, 100, 500 years, whatever, is 1. Okay, because it's a ratio of carbon dioxide to carbon dioxide. Okay, a lot to absorb here. Any questions? Um, what, what does it mean that those numbers go up and then back down? It means that the, it, it's a reflection of this integral. It means that in time close to zero, carbon dioxide soaked up much faster than these other gases. So the denominator goes down and the quotient goes up. The ratio goes up. But over longer periods of time, carbon dioxide isn't disappearing at all, but the numerator is going down faster. That's what it means. Right, so in other words, we didn't just make this table up for the integral. It, it actually is the integral. So you, you should, you know, you can go and kind of do it yourself, draw some estimated rectangles and, you know, see what this integral should be, the area under the curve. And uh, you see that it, it goes up a lot as you're going out in the future. The rectangles just get wider and wider and wider, right? whereas you've got exponential decay in the numerator. Other questions? Okay. Well, we should talk about some other gases besides... Uh, carbon dioxide.
Here's the example of methane. All right. In 1992, the total anthropogenic emission of methane was uh, 3.75 times 10 to the 11th kilograms. What is this as an equivalent emission of carbon dioxide if the 20-year time horizon is considered? The reason we have global warming potential, the reason we develop it as a metric, is to be able to calculate this. You can pull it straight down from a table. You ask, what is this as an equivalent emission of CO2 if a 20-year time horizon is considered? Well, take that emission and multiply it by the 20-year global warming potential of methane, which happens to be in the table. All right, we can go back. Here's methane. Methane has a lifetime of 12.2. We could calculate it ourselves, but it's actually given to you. The global warming potential of methane is 56 for 20 years. And it comes from this equation. Right? In this case, we would take the ratio of the forcings. It would be 58. Tau is 12.2. We use the 20-year time horizon. So uh, the integral of RCO2, TDT, would be roughly 13.2. And you get the answer 56. So the equivalent, the take-home message here of global warming potential is I can convert an emission of any gas to an equivalent emission of CO2 through these factors. And since over 20 years, by the definition of global warming potential, the GWP of methane is 56, I take my emission, so suppose it's one kilogram of methane, the 20-year equivalent emission of CO2 would be 56. It's as, as if I emitted 56 kilograms of CO2. Okay, so basically what we do to solve this problem, take 3.75 times 10 to the 11th kilograms, multiply it by 56. Okay, so just take the GWP20 times the emission rate, and we get 2.1 times 10 to the 13th kilograms methane as carbon dioxide. Right, so we're expressing the methane emission as carbon dioxide. Uh, first question. So given this model, then, can't we, can't we extrapolate, you know, given current emissions, climate change? And yeah, let me come back to it. Okay. Yes. Oh, um, and they do a good job. Is this the type of data that would be in a life cycle assessment? In an impact assessment, Impact, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Other question. That's why we're doing it. Because now I can give you problems like, you know, it's, it's, suppose, uh, you know, vehicle miles traveled in the United States is X, and the average fuel efficiency is Y, how much gas is burned, and you calculate that, figure out how much carbon actually makes it into the atmosphere. It turns out it's been estimated that the atmospheric fraction of carbon emissions that make it into the atmosphere is about 46 percent. So you multiply that by 0.46, and then you just go to the table and give an equivalent. So then you know how much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and now you can use the climate sensitivity parameter to calculate how many degrees Celsius uh, are associated with that emission. Exactly. And that's an impact metric. Sort of. If temperature is your measure, right? If you're worried about, you know, glaciers melting and, um, how much rainfall and uh, well, all the things you get into, weather-related morbidity, uh, water scarcity and distribution, you know, well, that's the impacts are much harder to measure. But these are impacts that at least as, you know, people can agree upon and use. Okay? So that's not too tough. And here's basically the point I was trying to raise before. These are 1992 emissions. We already looked at methane. Uh, 5 times 10 to the 11th kilograms. And you see, here's the 20-year potential we just calculated, 2.1 times 10 to the 13th. If we, uh, yeah, if we look at how much global warming potential is associated with methane in 100 years, it's going down relative to carbon dioxide, right? Because carbon dioxide is relatively steady and methane's being decayed in the atmosphere with, uh, um, at a faster rate, right? And 0.2. So generally, what you see is the fraction of CO2 is going up with time. All right, so global warming potentials go down at a long time. So if we just look at methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide, you can see how the relative impacts on forcing 
is changing as a function of time between 20, 100, and 500 years. So you can make all these calculations now. Let's say something about the individual uh, gases first. Uh, here is major greenhouse gases, uh, gas forcing uh, since 1850. 64% uh, is attributable to carbon dioxide. Right. Remember, we said already that the amount of forcing is going to be proportional not only to how strong of a greenhouse gas it is, where those absorption bands end up, but how much gas. And we've emitted a lot of carbon dioxide. Methane's about 20%. Halocarbons are about 11%, even though they're in the parts per trillion range, about 11%. Nitrous oxide, about 6%. Right, so we can change refrigerants, right? But what we're changing to may address the ozone problem, but they may not do much about global warming potential. Right, so that's another point uh, that you can derive from what we've discussed here. And this is the gases over time. Here's methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and CFC-11. Uh, changes since you know, roughly for methane, you know, they say about 1,000, year 1,000 here, up to year 2,000. OK, you see the exponential increase. Increases of about 250% since the Industrial Revolution. Carbon dioxide we've looked at a number of times. Nitrous oxide up, this looks a little bit more linear, right? It turns out that um, humans are not as big of a cause in nitrous oxide increases. Um, CFC 11, you see linear increases also, but steadying out as we discussed last week. Okay. Uh, now, just to remind ourselves, methane, uh, what's, where's methane come from? Landfills. Landfills digested tracts of ruminant animals. Where else? Fossil fuel, right? Production of fossil fuel, burning fossil fuel, natural gas, right? production of biomass for burning, perhaps, farming, human waste. All right, these are the sources. Um, this is about 90% we can account for of the anthropogenic uh, sources come from farming and uh, human waste, um, and fossil fuels. CFCs, we've already noted. We know where they come from. We know how they're used. Forcings are large compared to methane, compared to carbon dioxide. What about nitrous oxide? Where does nitrous oxide come from? N2O. Does anyone know? Yeah. Emissions. <coughs> Emissions from where? Like uh, automobiles. What's interesting is um, we don't emit N2O from an engine. When we looked at the equations for combustion, we talked about nitric oxide NO. And we talked about nitrogen dioxide NO2. And we talked about the catalytic converter magically solving this problem, but we didn't say where the nitrogen ended up. And it turns out it is the catalytic converter that releases N2O. And that N2O is quite stable. Right? So you solve one problem and contribute some to another. The atmospheric lifetime of N2O, there are no tropospheric sinks for N2O. It does not become small. It makes its way up into the stratosphere, and its lifetime is about 110 years, I believe. I don't think I wrote it down. Let me see what it was. 120 years, sorry about 120 years for the lifetime of nitrous oxide. Okay, there are other sources. About 40% of the increase you can see here on the slide uh, is due to anthropogenic sources. The other sources are natural. From the oceans, right, we said more iron fertilization of the oceans, more nitrous oxide released from the ocean. So oceans naturally release some N2O. Industrial chemicals, fertilizer production, uh, rainforest clearing, uh, the denitrification process, which uh, we didn't talk much this semester about microbiology, uh, but there's nitrification and denitrification. Uh, microbes release N2O. And now if that's built up in the soil, and now you clear some land, 
especially in the rainforest, there'll be release of N2O. Okay, so agriculture also. Okay. This concentration is about 15% greater than it was before the Industrial Revolution. So that may seem relatively small compared to methane, carbon dioxide, and CFC-11, which didn't exist at all before the Industrial Revolution. But the point is it has a strong forcing associated with it, 206, if we look at the ratio. Okay. So nitrous oxide turns out to be important when we, um, you know, about 6%, we can account for. Okay. Ozone doesn't show up here, but what's interesting about ozone is we're going to have this ozone hole uh, repairing itself, hopefully, in the next 60 years. And remember, there was an o there was a absorption ban of ozone, right? Absorbing and re-radiating heat back to Earth, right? So ozone's quite important, but it's hard to come up with a model for ozone. Our confidence in terms of the forcing associated with ozone is low. It's not mixed perfectly in the vertical direction, right, it, with altitude, and it's not mixed evenly around the globe. So it's hard to know what the impacts of ozone will be, but as it recovers, uh, we can only expect the forcing to be positive. Okay. Aerosols. Aerosols, we've already talked about as being difficult. You can have sulfate, right, and we're trying to reduce sulfate. Aerosols we talked about as being mostly negative forcing, either directly by reflecting radiation back out into space or indirectly by being nuclei for cloud formation. What happens as we control particulate, sulfate in particular, right? What happens is less negative forcing. So control one source of pollution, perhaps contribute more to global warming. Soot, a different type of particle that we've talked about this term. Soot is this tar-like substance, right? What do you know about tar? And you don't want to be working on a, on a near asphalt or tar on a hot summer day because it absorbs heat, right? A lot of it. And tar-like soot will absorb heat and re-radiate it down. That's positive for thing, right? So if we can control the soot, right, then we can have a, essentially a negative delta F. Okay, so you see this particulate issue is quite uh, complicated. And the other issue contributing here, not only is particulate uh, very inhomogeneous in the atmosphere, both with respect to altitude, but with respect to location, it's short-lived in the atmosphere, right? If we all just stopped emitting particulate and we're able to get the forest fires down and the like, uh, for a few weeks, the air would clean very quickly. Right, so the, it's short-lived also. You might have more medium-term range related to the size of the particulate, and the reflectivity is also related to the size. You see why this is a, quite a complicated issue, because the emissions are, are stochastic and the uh, distributions are inhomogeneous. Okay, that's, I think, what, what I wanted to say about, about aerosol. Uh, the shape of the particles also matters. Right? Okay, so you see why you know this this gets quite difficult, and why you know if you read uh, Lumberg's book about uh, uh, the truth about the environment, whatever, whatever the title of the book was, um, you know if, even if you read the chapter on, on global warming, there uh, he's not so much saying that the science is bad. What he's saying is there's so many scenarios. You know, why do they pick this scenario over that scenario, right? Uh, again, there's, there's money to be made, you know, taking the side that this isn't a problem, right? People are, are there are a lot of people out there who, who will pay you if, if people will listen to you, right, to be the authority on the issue, right? So if you look into the science and you say, well, you know, I can't really refute the science, uh, so I'm going to refute the way that the estimates were done and the assumptions that were made. You can create a lot of confusion, right? And that, you know, you can look at even commercials, right? Um, I'm, well, I, okay, I try not to get too political, but uh, there's some commercials going on these days um, about the Open Spaces Act uh, here that, um, you know, they're trying to pass a, um, a tax, essentially, that will pay farmers not to sell uh, land to developers. Right? And I'll just put my bias on the table. I'm, I'm strongly in favor of it. 
Uh, but um, you know, it's try, trying to combat sprawl or at least moving it somewhere else. Because uh, I don't know if you can really prevent sprawl or not. But I uh, don't want it in my backyard. Uh, but the point is that um, you, know, you look at the commercials. And you know, who's in favor of sprawl in their backyard? You know, maybe nobody. So you just watch the commercials. And they're very confusing, right? Uh, so you know, my point here is not to take a certain side on, on an issue, uh, but to get you to be aware and to look for statements that people tend to make that just add confusion to the issue. Right? Um, just, you know, so the default, if you're confused, is just not to do anything. Right? So it's, it's, an, it's an excellent political strategy. Right? So um, that's why we try to you know, promote clarity in this class and what we know and what we don't know. And uh, here are the four things. We've been through these already. But this is the kicker. All right. We ask the question. We're still on our question. Does human activity contribute to the warming that we have observed in the last 150 years? This diagram screams to me, yes, at least for now. And the reason is what you're looking at is the actual measured temperature between 1860 and late 90s and predictions. And when I first started talking in classrooms about greenhouse gas emissions, the best models of the day were this dashed line. This is in the early 90s, this dashed line. And very few people, if I were to ask you know, how many people should you know, believe that this global warming thing might be real. Only two or three people, even in a room of hundreds, would raise their hand. Say, well, you know, those models overpredict, right? And you can see the models overpredicted. And you might wonder why. And the reason why is because particulate matter, especially sulfate, uh, was not factored in to those uh, models. And we've learned a lot since the late 80s and early 90s about particulate and their impact on global warming. Even though there's some uncertainty, we still have point estimates. And when you factor in particulate matter into the model, you get predictions that are quite good, explaining the curves over the last 150 years. Right. And so what I challenge the folks who say that this is not something that we should be concerned about, global warming, I challenge them to come up with temperature predictions better than this, or as good as this, because they don't exist. Go to the other side of this issue. Right? Go to Arizona. There's some, some very vocal people there and in other places in Washington who are saying that we should not be thinking about this issue. It's not an important issue. Um, the, the estimates are wrong and, and what have you. Come up with a better model. Come up with one that does pretty well. All right, this isn't perfect, of course. And there are a lot of assumptions and a lot of problems, too. As it was mentioned in the front here on Wednesday, uh, there are things like time lag. And uh, you know, the, the, if, if you think of it as a control system uh, sort of perspective, right? I emit something today. When's the effect of that warming, right? Uh, the models can't do that very well. They're very much averaged, right? Because we're talking about average surface temperatures. So we can't expect them to be perfect. But this is doing a good job. And there's nothing else out there that's coming anywhere close to this. Uh, so the point here is that our models that reflect the understanding that we have about carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, nitrous oxides, particulates, and other greenhouse gases that we can directly account for, do a good job explaining the, the recent past where we have some pretty good temperature estimates. Um, so you know, this tells me that conservatively, if we are to be conservative you know, from the paradigm that we should be leaving a, at least as good of an environment, if not better environment, for tomorrow than we have today, if we're going to be conservative about that issue, then we have to assume that this human activity is contributing to these observed variations. Of course, natural variations were factored in also. Right? The estimates aren't perfect. The uh, 
models are perfect. And we've talked about a number of reasons why already. But it does a decent job. And there, again, there isn't anything out there doing better. So we can get into debates about assumptions, and we can get into debates about who's doing what, and when things will happen, and what's the ultimate impact. But you know, again, these are estimates, and we have data, and we can compare the estimates to the data, and it's not bad. Question in the back. I was just going to ask about the, the time lag um, that, you, that you had brought up, and, and do they have ballparks on you know, when something is released and then when, it would, when the actual global warming impact is? Is it 10 years, or is it the magnitude of 50 years, or do they even? But the calibration constants, right, these lambdas? Yeah. And uh, they, I mean, they're all s it's sort of a function of time, right? I mean, if you think about lambda, uh, that's our climate sensitivity parameter. So it tells me what a change in a forcing is as a, a function of, I'm sorry, it tells me what the change in temperature is as a function of a change in forcing. Um, is that the same if I've got 200 parts per million, 300 parts per million, or 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide? No. Um, the, so you have to look at the time scale over which we have averaged these parameters, and it's on the scale of decades, right? Uh, but you know, so the, the point is, you couldn't do better than that because these are calibrated models. And and looking at basically 1920s and 30s and and 40s, I guess, and thinking industrial revolution, and that's when they were polluting a ton. And I'm just I'm wondering, and I know that there's a lot more industry today than there was then. But I'm wondering if they were emitting so much more then, and if we're feeling the lag of the effects 50 years ago, what, what the amount of pollutants that happened. And, and if we, now that we're smarter about it and more educated about it, are we getting it under control? And I'm wondering, are we feeling that, and, you know, that it is going up, but then there's a potential that it could be a hump, that it goes back down? Because today, if we're controlling our emissions that much better, then fi is it 50 years from now that you know that they'll be feeling the effects of that? I don't have in this presentation, but I'll I will include them for Monday, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll spend a few minutes finishing up on Monday. Uh, the, the response of the atmosphere to different uh, scenarios uh, regarding control of emissions. Uh, yes, those time lags are a reflection of this table here. Right, what the lifetime of the gases are. They say, well, they were polluting so much more in the 30s. I disagree. Uh, it depends on your pollution. We're emitting far more carbon and greenhouse gases now than we ever did before. But the pollution was more visible. Right? We're controlling sulfate now. We're controlling particulates now. We're, our stacks are taller. It doesn't mean a hill of beans with respect to this problem. We're driving more. Right? We're producing more. More countries are at a higher standard of living. Right? So the fact is that, and we talked about the forcing since 19, or 1850, 64% of that is carbon dioxide of that forcing. Uh, that's going up exponentially. Uh, methane also increasing, so well correlated with human activity that's going up exponentially. CFCs are bringing under control, but that was only 11% of the problem. And there are concerns, especially with the semiconductor industry and refrigerants, that we're going to you know, offset the CFCs now with the utilization of other gases. That's a concern, especially uh, sulfur hexafluoride, which is a gas. We didn't talk about electronics here, but that's an important gas used in semiconductor manufacturing. Okay, but I'll bring those scenarios in. But the upshot is that people, in, I think I've got the temperature estimates coming up here after a couple of examples after a couple of examples, but the, the temperature increase is sort of exponential, okay. even in the best scenario. We're headed towards a double CO2 world, roughly before the Industrial Revolution, 270 parts per million carbon dioxide. Now we're about 380. So double CO2 is about 540. Uh, two times <coughs> CO2 world, almost unavoidable. You know, and you know, I kind of say that you know, in, in a defeatist sort of way, uh, but that's where we're going. Four times CO2 world's likely. Uh, so there's no reason to expect that the temperature increases won't be linear or exponential. I'll show those later. Would you attribute that most, mostly to the automobile? Or do you think that there's... Um, One third is from 
industrial activity, roughly. In the, I, I can only give North American statistics, is what I know off the top of my head. We are the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, so in North America, one third is industrial activity. About one third is transportation. About 20% is residential. And about 20% roughly is um, commercial. Okay. That adds up to nearly 100. Agriculture is in there, cement's in there, um, methane, municipal waste is in there. But those are just rough numbers. So most of it, no, but it's the biggest in the biggest category contributed, about one third. Other question? Does the model that you just showed take into account the carbon cycle? Yes, because of so, this. Well, I guess what I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around is, is that there's, there's a certain amount that is absorbed back, you know, by the oceans and uh -huh. trees and whatnot. Now, given that it's increasing exponentially, it's kind of like that rubber band that kind of breaks. How, how do you? It, it seems like that uh, there's a, there's getting to a certain point where it's going to really, really go up, and there won't be any more. Okay, uh, yeah. let's come back to your point because, um, yeah, I think it, what's and this is uh, the central. What you're alluding to is the central theme of the book Al Gore wrote, Earth in the Balance, that there are certain equilibrium states uh, that the planet might be in, and you can shift very rapidly from one to the other. Uh, this, this is something to be concerned about. It's there, there are the potential surprises associated with greenhouse gas emissions. That's question number four. Uh, what are the expected consequences of global warming, regardless of where it comes from? So I'll just delay your the answer to your question probably until Monday. Other questions? Okay, there, there's kind of a neat problem. I, I'm going to do these a little bit out of order because I want to give you something provoking to think about over the weekend while you're tr treating me. Okay, um, and, and that's this one. And during the 1980s, approximately 3.3 gigatons of carbon were released into the atmosphere. Okay, that's over the de decade. Now, this accounts for the airborne fraction, right? If I have a, you know, if I'm a, lo if I'm a locomotive or if I'm a, a truck going down the road and I emit uh, carbon dioxide uh, and other forms of carbon, uh, some of that's going to end up on the ground. Some of it's going to get soaked up almost instantaneously by plants as fertilizer. So we have to define something called the airborne fraction. How much of an emission, right? If I, if I light a candle in my jack-o'-lantern, Right, what fraction of that emi emission, carbon dioxide emissions, can end up in the atmosphere? And that has been estimated to be 0.46%. Uh, and again, going back to the question in the back, uh, that's an average over a decade of measurements. So uh, you know, there's going to be large variation depending on the emission and the locality, but there's a huge averaging going on here. Okay. Uh, now, let's use that airborne fraction. During the 1980s, over 10 years, approximately 3.3 gigatons of carbon were released to the atmosphere. What's the predicted increase in global mean temperature due to the 1990s? Assume the concentration of carbon dioxide was 350 parts per million in 1980. Okay? So, let's just solve this problem. And there's one element of solving this problem that I'm going to show you where I got it from on Monday. But I think this is a more thought-provoking question to leave you with. Okay? So first of all, we've got uh, 10 years here, right? So 10 years, we're looking at 3.3 gigatons of carbon per year. Right, and that included the airborne fraction, right? So something closer to, uh, to 6 is the actual emission, and that's what you're going to see in your notes. And I'm just going to add one piece of information for you that I'll derive on Monday. Okay, and this is that for every one part per million increase in carbon dioxide, it takes an emission of 2.1 gigatons of carbon. Right, so there's 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1980. If I emit 2.1 gigatons of carbon on top of that baseline emission, then I go up by one part per million. So corresponding to 10 years right, of 3.3 gigatons of carbon per year, right, I get 33 gigatons of carbon. And I've got 2.1 gigatons of carbon 
being one part per million. So it's about 15, right? So roughly 33 over 2 is about 15, or 15.7, actually. The increase, let's say the um, delta concentration of CO2, I'll use brackets like we used before, delta change in concentration of carbon dioxide is about 15.7 parts per million. Now in our problem, we said the baseline concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 350 parts per million. So basically, between 1980, we have 350 parts per million. And in 1990, we have 350 plus 15.7 parts per million. OK, this is easy enough. When you get into where this 2.1 came from, you should know. I mean, we could just leave it alone and, and keep going with the class, but I'd be remiss in my duty not to talk about where that 2.1 came from. OK, so we got 365.7 versus 350. OK, so uh, how do I translate this into a change in temperature? What I need to know is the change in forcing that's related to a change in concentration. And I'm going to write an equation down, and this is new. Delta F is equal to K times the natural log of the new concentration of CO2 over the old concentration of CO2. Okay. And if we go back to the slides here for just a minute, okay, you see this is up here, the same equation I just wrote on the board. Delta F equals K times the natural log of carbon, the, you, how much, uh, or I should say the concentration, over the concentration you originally had. Okay. So uh, this is a conceptual diagram showing how a change in concentration leads to a change in forcing. We already know how a change in forcing leads to a change in temperature. That's a climate sensitivity parameter that affects that. Now, when you have a low concentration of gas, such as uh, CFC11, in the parts per trillion range, the relationship between a change in concentration and a change in forcing is linear. Follows Beer's law. I made a mention of that earlier. Right here is the change in concentration times K is delta F. It's linear. But as you have more and more gas in the atmosphere, it becomes less and less linear. It takes more gas to affect the same forcing which I guess is good, right? unless you're emitting tons of this stuff. So here is a different form for methane and nitrous oxide that are found in the parts per billion range, right? going up from parts per trillion. And here is our form for carbon dioxide, which is in the parts per million range. So more carbon dioxide. Um, it's a, a gentler slope. It's the logarithmic form we use. Okay, and you'll have problems in the homework for methane and for halocarbons and for carbon dioxide. You have to know which equation to use. Right? So it follows from where on this curve you are. Okay? Where does K come from? K is measured empirically. And my battery is fully charged. How about that? Okay. All right. So now if I just finish this problem off as we finish up here. Right? Delta F is equal to K natural log of our new concentration over our old concentration. Uh, the K for carbon dioxide is 6.3. That would be something given to you. 6.3 times the natural log of 365.7 times 350. So the change in forcing put it in a place you can see it, delta F equals 0 0.276 watts per meter square. Right? And of course, the change in temperature that will be associated with this is something like lambda, delta F equals 0.54 times 0.28, right, and we get something like 
0 0.15 degrees C. Right. Beginning to get very quantitative about this, right? So we finish here, and I'm a couple minutes over. Uh, just back here on the slide now. Basically, you see this is roughly in line. You remember this uh, plot? I've just shortened it down between uh, 1980 and 1990. You know, we can see here it's in line with the actual emission of about 0.13 degrees uh, Celsius, or the, the actual observed increase. That's about 1.3 degrees Celsius. Okay? So this is how these types of calculations are made. Uh, we'll give a couple more examples on Monday uh, and then uh, thrust our way into eco design. Okay, so have a good Halloween and a uh, good weekend in between, and we'll see you Monday. Uh, this is where it's finished up on Friday. Basically, um, we calculated how one could estimate uh, over a decade's time, 1980 to 1990, uh, the average increase in surface temperature by taking emissions of uh, carbon dioxide, in particular, uh, estimating the forcing based on an increase, I believe it was about 15 parts per million increase in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere between 1980 and 1990. We showed how we might be able to get an estimate of average surface temperature rise in that time. And we basically saw a number you know, very, very close to 0.15 degrees Celsius here. We didn't look at other positive forcings or negative forcings, but the idea here is just to show you that the order of magnitude is in the ballpark. Now, one of the key factors that we needed uh, to derive the average surface temperature rise in the 1980s uh, was how many uh, gigatons of carbon needs to be released into the atmosphere for a one part per million increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And I just gave that to you as 2.1 gigatons carbon uh, uh, for a one part per million increase in carbon dioxide. So we should go through on the board how we get that. But remember, it, and as you do the homework and uh, as we approach uh, the exam coming up in uh, two or three weeks now, uh, the thing to keep in mind with these global warming problems is uh, first you have to calculate what the emissions are. Okay? So if you've got cars driving down the road or uh, cement production or what have you, uh, you have to calculate the emissions as a first step. Uh, the second step then is to calculate the airborne fraction, how much of that carbon it's going to actually make its way into the atmosphere. And we gave that airborne fraction as about 0.46 or 46 percent. So for every kilogram of carbon dioxide emitting, emitted, uh, we have about 460 grams of carbon dioxide that actually reaches the atmosphere. At that point, we use this conversion, right, 2.1 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere is equal to roughly one part per million increase in concentration in the atmosphere. We'll go through that calculation right now. But after you know the increase in concentration for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then you convert that into a forcing. We talked about the logarithmic relationship between the change in the concentration, the ratio of the concentration before, I'm sorry, the concentration after to the concentration before. Right, we took the nat natural log of that ratio multiplied it by K, K for carbon dioxide was 6.3. And that got us delta F, the change in forcing, attributable to that change in carbon dioxide concentration. Once you have the change in forcing, then you multiply by the climate sensitivity parameter lambda. It's about 0.54. Right? That's our, our best estimate of lambda. And that gets you the average surface temperature change. And we went through that example on Friday. But we would be remiss in our duty just to give you the uh, 2.1 gigaton carbon per part per million increase in atmospheric concentration if we didn't show you where that came from. And it turns out uh, it's not very hard to do. So if we come over to uh, panel number one here, uh, we'll ask the question, that we'll just call it an example here, uh, for a one part per million increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration, uh, what is the provoking load of carbon 
Okay, so first we need the definition of, of part per million. Uh, does anybody remember what one part per million is? If we talk about a volumetric ratio, what does that actually mean? Going way back, we'll be chemistry or physics. Right, that might mean, if we're talking about volume per volume ratio, uh, what we're really talking about here is one cubic meter of carbon in 10 to the 6 cubic meters of air. Right, one, 10 to the 6, of course, a million. Okay, so if we start from that definition, right, we can calculate the provoking load. So let's uh, basically break this up into two parts. Number one, let's say how many grams carbon are in one cubic meter of air at one part per million. Okay. So basically we say one part per million. Okay, and as we just said, one cubic meter of carbon in ten to the six cubic meters of air. Right. Uh, now, we know the relationship between grams and moles. We do need to recall the relationship between moles and volume of air. Does anybody remember what that relationship is? Standard temperature and pressure. All right, you go back uh, again to Chem 101. Are you talking about PV equals NRT? Uh, no, it's related to that, though. Uh, not exactly. The um, relationship at standard temperature and pressure uh, between a mole of a gas and its volume uh, is this magic number 22.45. Right, does anybody remember if one mole of a gas at uh, standard temperature and pressure occupies about 22 and a half liters of volume? And it was this magic number. You can get it from PV equals nRT. Uh, but it was uh, one of these magic numbers which we used a lot back in Chem 101. So we'll say that one mole of carbon dioxide at standard temperature and pressure is 22.4 times 10 to the minus 3 liters. Ah, I'm sorry, meters cubed. There's a thousand liters in a, in a cubic meter. Okay. Well, we also know that um, in a mole of carbon dioxide, There's 12 grams of carbon. Right, the molecular weight of carbon dioxide is 44. There's 12 grams of carbon uh, corresponding to the molecular weight of carbon. Okay. So 12 plus 32 is 44. Okay, so if we go ahead and multiply this out, we see 5.3 times 10 to the minus 4 grams of carbon per cubic meter of air at one part per million. Okay. So not a lot. Okay. But of course this is a cubic meter of air. And we're interested in how much air is there in the atmosphere, right? If we knew the volume of the atmosphere, that means the Earth's atmosphere, and we multiplied across, then we would know how many grams of carbon we would need to emit to the atmosphere to affect a one part per million increase in the concentration in the atmosphere. Okay? Right, and of course, expressing that as CO2. So, our second question is how many cubic meters are there in the atmosphere? What is the volume of the atmosphere? Okay, and for this you need a few pieces of information. 
uh, which aren't given to you. Uh, first, we need the density of the atmosphere. And if we assume one atmosphere, pressure is 1291 grams per cubic meter. And if you knew the mass of the atmosphere, then you could find out the volume. OK, and the mass is about 5.21 times 10 to the 21st grams. So basically, what we can do is multiply the density um, times, I'm sorry, divide the, um, yes, the mass by the density, and we'll get the volume. Okay, so the volume is equal to the mass of the atmosphere of the density of the atmosphere. And dividing these two numbers, we get uh, roughly 4 times 10 to the 18th cubic meters. OK, so it's a quite, a quite a big atmosphere, as you'd imagine. Okay. So now what we can do is we can multiply across. We know the volume of the atmosphere. We know how many grams of carbon there are in a part per million carbon in the air, right? That's over here. So we multiply across 5.3 times 10 to the minus 4 times, over here, 4 times 10 to the 18th. OK, so uh, we'll say that um, for one part per million increase, And carbon is equal to the product 5.3 times 10 to the minus 4. And, and that's in units of grams carbon per cubic meter air times roughly 4 times 10 to the 18th cubic meters of air in the atmosphere. and we arrive at down here our number 2.1 times 10 to the 15th grams of carbon. And a gigaton is 10 to the 15th grams. Okay, so that's where our magic number came from. So going through the sequence again, okay, what do we need? We need the emission. We need the airborne fraction, 0.46. Then we need to put that emission, that airborne fraction that makes it into the atmosphere, into some context. What is the change in concentration of carbon in the atmosphere? Well, for every part per million, you have to emit 2.1 times 10 to the 15th grams of carbon. Okay. You can go through similar, similar calculations for other greenhouse gases, and we won't. Okay. Carbon dioxide is the most important. Then after this, you get your change in the concentration. Change in concentration gets you the change in forcing. From the change in forcing, then, you get to the change in temperature through the climate sensitivity parameter. OK, so there's a chain. OK, and, and one thing to have straight as we go through problems, uh, such as we did last Friday, is to have very clear that step of operations. Okay. Then there aren't any problems we can't ask you. Okay. There's a question over here. The density of the atmosphere dependent on the it is. suit? Yeah, so we assume one, one atmosphere here. Uh, it's, it's most of the atmosphere is at the bottom. So it's not a bad uh, assumption. But you're right. Uh, certainly the, the density of the atmosphere is not constant. Other questions? OK, then we should say something about these emissions. If we take a look at the slides, then. Uh, we remember how we got our estimate of the decade's change in temperature. Um, talk about the emissions. So these are from the United States. And this question came up last time also. Uh, fossil fuel burning is about 99% of carbon dioxide uh, emissions in, in the US. 
Okay, and if we go back to 1997 numbers, it's about one third is from industrial activity, about one third again from transportation, about one fifth from residential energy use, and about a sixth from uh, commercial energy use. Okay, there are other sources. Cement came up, and I think I might have misheard the question that was asked. The, the question was, uh, is this related to uh, carbonates or bicarbonates? Um, the actual answer is, is that there's two components there to the contribution of cement manufacture uh, to carbon dioxide release. Number one is just the fact that you have to heat this limestone to fire it, and that takes a lot of energy, often coming from fossil fuels. Uh, the other is the conversion, uh, not of bicarbonate, but of calcium carbonate, right? CaCO3. Okay, and, and in the process of firing, and I, I might have misunderstood the question, in the process of firing, uh, that calcium carbonate, CaCO3, uh, becomes calcium oxide, CaO. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, CaO. And you're left, of course, with CO2, just in the mass balance. Okay, so there is some carbon dioxide released from that process also. Okay, and cement manufacturer, we uh, went through, uh, listed that one out separately. Uh, because it is significant, and the, the uh, cement industry is under some fire. Uh, we talk about emissions trading of carbon dioxide. They're one of the prime targets. Okay. But of course, there are other sources of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere, agriculture, deforestation, landfills, uh, industrial production, and mining. Now, if we look at some of these scenarios, and this speaks directly to the question that was asked on Friday, what's your have probably have a difficult time reading here in class. Uh, these are the emissions from fossil fuel combustion and cement production. Uh, there is some error associated. We'll just talk about the point estimates. About 5.5 uh, gigatons carbon per year. Uh, from changes in tropical land use, we talked about greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions. Uh, from this source also, about 1.6. So if we look at total from anthropogenic sources, we're somewhere around 7.1 gigatons carbon per year. Now there is some uptake. The oceans uptake uh, carbon. Forests in the northern hemisphere, we talked about the carbon cycle on Friday. It's about half a gigaton of carbon per year uptake. Uh, other terrestrial sinks, uh, we talk about carbon dioxide fertilization and climate effects, and I'm not too sure exactly what they're talking about. But uh, here they're listing about 1.3 gigatons of carbon sunk. So if you look at the net, you're somewhere around 3.3 gigatons carbon per year. Okay. Now, um, if we look at what is projected, these are carbon dioxide concentrations as they are predicted to rise over time between year 2000 and year 2100. And of course, a lot of uncertainty uh, regarding which path we are going to take. Okay, there are high CO2 estimates, uh, and what you see here on the top figure on the y-axis is carbon dioxide concentration. Again, on the x-axis, uh, year 2000 to 2100. Uh, we're, remember, before the Industrial Revolution, somewhere around 260, 270 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Now we're around 380, and the worst case scenario, 800 parts per million uh, well before the year 2100. Okay, so that's almost a four times CO2 world even before uh, the year 2100. Uh, we would have to get up to roughly 30 gigatons carbon emission. Remember, we're at 7.1 right now uh, for that to happen. So that's sort of the accelerated business as usual case where we don't take much in the way of serious action about carbon dioxide emissions. And in fact, we accelerate with the economic output, continue the exponential increases in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So we call that a Worst case scenario. Uh, the uh, likely overly optimistic uh, scenario is here at the bottom, uh, basically where we level out at about 450 parts per million. That's a double uh, CO2 world we're heading toward roughly in 2100 or shortly thereafter. Uh, this gets us to um, about 7 gigatons carbon per year, uh, about where we're at now. Uh, some slight increases, and then a significant drop to mid-1990 levels. Okay, so it's basically immediate and severe action uh, related to carbon emissions. 
And then, of course, a bunch of mid-level uh, scenarios. Uh, generally, the, the ones up the middle are taken as sort of realistic scenarios. The temperature increases related to these increases in carbon dioxide concentration are shown in the bottom figure here. So it's not just about uh, how much carbon you emit, but also it's about the aerosol background and other greenhouse gases too. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty in these estimates, as you're already aware. On the y-axis, you have the global temperature change in degrees Celsius up to 5 degrees Celsius. The dotted line assumes a constant uh, level of aerosols and increases in aerosol in the bottom scenario. Okay. So you see that uh, here's basically scenario number one, scenario number two, and scenario number three. Accelerated uh, worst case scenario, uh, best case scenario, and then a mid-level scenario. And you can see the uncertainty inherent to these projections. Uh, again, here's the, the mid-level is, is highlighted in green. I give you a sense of the variability. And one thing that, uh, is to note, these numbers came from 1996. Uh, we've already mentioned a couple times that in the year 2000, IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, increased their uh, projections in terms of uh, temperature change. Okay, so moving toward the upper range of this uh, filled-in zone. Okay. All right. Uh, so the, the red is the accelerated business as usual. And you can see, of course, the more carbon, the more uncertainty, uh, which seems to make sense. Right? The, the magnification, propagation of the errors. Uh, the blue is, again, leveling out severe and immediate action, um, about a degree uh, Celsius in temperature change, which would still put Earth roughly as warm as it's been in hundreds of thousands of years. How do we stabilize? What can we do? Uh, these are the various IPCC scenarios that were looked at. Uh, basically, leveling out, S you can think of as being for scenario or for steadying out at 450 parts per million. Uh, here's 550 parts per million, 650, 750, and 1,000. Now, the change in the load of carbon uh, that would be required to hit these targets are shown in the right-hand plot. Okay, so these are carbon dioxide emissions. You see we allow for continued increases in carbon emissions to the atmosphere, but uh, to study it out, there needs to be drastic reduction well below uh, what we're currently emitting. Right. So this is a part I didn't want to leave you with uh, for the weekend. It's actually sort of depressing when you think about it. Uh, by a certain time in the future, maybe it's 100 or 200 years in the future, uh, we have to be far below uh, about a fifth of our current emissions to steady out carbon in the atmosphere. And it doesn't necessarily depend much on which scenario you can see. Uh, these curves begin to come close together. Okay. So it's not about whether we need to take action. It's about how quickly we do it. Right? And if we, the faster we respond, uh, the lower the curve we're going to end up on over here on the left. Okay, so here's the 650 scenario. Many believe... Uh, it's beyond a two-time CO2 world. Uh, many believe that this is the most realistic. Right? Some increases out to uh, 2100, right? beyond which uh, we begin uh, lowering our emissions uh, down to about half where we're at now in the year 2200 and um, lowering concentrations beyond that. Question? These are numbers, and this is inevitable. And no. Next question. <laughs> Within the variabilities, the scenarios, is it just pretty much the output of this carbon? Or, I mean, do they take into consideration for, like, the difference in carbon cycle that could happen? Or is it just strictly output? Well, this is, um, this is a lot less debatable than the temperature change. It speaks to the first uh, question. Now, this, what we're looking at is strictly related to the carbon cycle which is something we understand much better than the climate response. So what you see here on the right-hand side are the emissions. And we have a pretty decent understanding of what we are emitting. How much actually remains in the atmosphere is one level of uncertainty beyond. OK, we had this plot, and it goes way back. And I won't try to find the slide. But you remember, we talked about constant CO2 emissions 
and what the, the uptake of carbon dioxide would be over 100 and 500 years under constant CO2 atmosphere and an increase in CO2 atmosphere. Right? This has been done with constant CO2 atmosphere. Right? So uh, you can consider them to be somewhat conservative with respect to how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Okay. Now one level of uncertainty beyond is our previous slide. Right? How does this relate into a temperature change? And there, there's much less agreement to go back to the first question, what the climate response would be. Right? But again, just because we don't know what that climate response could, is doesn't mean we don't know anything about this issue. Right? Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's plausible to expect uh, some warming uh, with increases. And, and these increases are massive. And we start talking about you know, 1,000 parts per million. Right, that's uh, almost down in the, the grams, right, milligrams per, per cubic meter. Right, this is a very high concentration. Right. So we can't imagine that's such a good thing, uh, regardless of the climate response. And again, we don't know which way the feedbacks are going to go necessarily. Okay, and this is again showing the 650 uh, scenario. Uh, these were, basically what you see here is uh, 1.5 is the lower end in the S650 scenario. Uh, by the year uh, 2500, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is 4.5 degrees Celsius on the upper end. Remembering the more we've learned about forcings and feedback, IPCC has been increasing their estimates in terms of temperature impact, not decreasing them. Okay, but again, we can't uh, ignore the uncertainties that are involved. Okay, anything could happen, right? Volcanoes could erupt and um, you know, climate can have uh, responses we couldn't predict. I, I think we have to expect uh, the fact that uh, there will be things happening that uh, we haven't predicted in advance. Right? But this is the best that people can do right now. Okay, any other questions? Before we get into the real fuzzy part of this, right? What are the predicted consequences of global warming? All right, and these were those IPCC estimates, right? From about 1.5 degrees Celsius in 2100 to about um, 4 degrees Celsius. We mentioned that those have increased, right? And you can basically X out this uh, lower estimate if you uh, believe those estimates that are coming out of uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and our National Academy of Sciences. All right, so this would be a more accurate depiction. So I've uh, sort of taken out the, the lower line and, and put in the upper line here. So somewhere between 2 and 6 degrees Celsius, up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit on the upper end. Okay, and, and that's uh, uh, quite warm. Even if it's at the lower end of this, uh, it'll make uh, Earth the warmest it's been in, in hundreds of thousands of years. And toward the upper end, we're talking about the age of the dinosaur okay. in terms of temperature doesn't mean that the, the cause of the warming is the same as the time of the dinosaurs, but uh, uh, that's about this level of, of increase. Question in the back. Yeah, that's what I kind of was thinking just a moment ago. You've got the gases, and we know that having the gases in the air is not necessarily good for humans, but where does the link necessarily occur with global warming? Because I'm sure there's skeptics that say the, the Earth is going to get warm anyway. So if it was warm 100 years ago, 100,000 million, whatever years ago, it'll get warm again. And another couple hundred million years, it'll get warm again. So why are we linking necessarily our causes to something that's going to happen in it's nature? It's the speed regardless? of change. That in terms of the temperature record, uh, the, it is very rare for climactic shifts to occur in 100 or 200 years. That in general, uh, although you know, locally, certainly these types of temperature variations are possible. Globally, on average, this is uh, quite rare. And we have models that you know, claim to understand the absorption and re-radiation of heat back to Earth. And they do a pretty decent job predicting the temperature record in the last 150 years. Uh, in the absence of other models to predict the most recent temperature record, it's conservative to assume that uh, these models will predict well into the future. Now, as we get further and further away from the present, you can expect the uncertainty to increase more and more, and that's reflected here. Uh, but you know, nobody's making the claim that the sources are the same. Well, maybe some people are. 
But in terms of variations that we understand, there are, and, and I didn't mention this, it's in your reading, uh, sunspots, you know, we're aware of the variation in the sun cycle at every 11 years or so. Uh, we're aware of the wobble of the Earth. We're aware of the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. And these are periodic, and these have been noted in the temperature record. What we've seen in the last 150 years is not explained by any of those phenomena. Okay, so yeah, certainly variations and you know, Earth getting warmer and, and cycles is, is, is part of the gig. Uh, but there is believed to be, and again going back to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and our National Academy of Sciences, to be a discernible human influence. And that's shown up in uh, the model we, we um, showed the temperature predictions last Friday on uh, the last 150 years. Our models do a good job predicting the temperature increases that we've observed. Uh, so again, uh, we shouldn't just throw them out because we're moving into the future in the absence of something better. Okay. So uh, certainly there's a, a ton of uncertainty here. And uh, if we assume that there will be some warming, and again, how much and when, you know, I wouldn't claim that th these estimates are, are accurate on, on either side of zero. Okay. But certainly, um, you know, it would make sense that uh, you know, you'd have more extreme high temperature events and a decrease in low temperature events. Right? So these are some of the consequences of temperature rises as suggested by the scientists in the Intergovernmental Panel on, Ch on Climate Change. Okay. They have models. The models predict uh, less warming at the poles relative to the mid-latitudes. More energy in the skies, which is an increased frequency of extreme weather events. A rising sea level, that's fairly plausible. Uh, density is directly proportional to temperature. Uh, increased ice melt and reduced ocean salinity, uh, leading to lower temperatures in Europe. I'll say more about that in uh, just a second. Uh, but salinity in the ocean is related to the uh, current. Okay. This is basically the Atlantic uh, current. Uh, it's called the Atlantic conveyor. In, in fact, uh, Europe is a lot warmer than it should be. If you look at Athens, Greece, and compare its latitude to uh, Chicago or Detroit is roughly the same, yet Athens is quite warm. And of course, at our latitude here in the United States, it's uh, not so warm. A uh, big part of the reason is the ocean currents, uh, the winds basically, warm air from the tropics that finds its way up the uh, near Mediterranean coast here in the Atlantic, right? Basically, water uh, as it moves north over England right, begins to evaporate. Okay, and that evaporation is what helps to warm the air over Europe. Okay, so assume you have some warming and some ice melting, particularly here in Greenland. What will happen is um, basically the pump that drives these currents, it, there is a concern that that pump will become either weaker or shut down completely. Uh, it is known that this pump has shut down very quickly in the past, right, and that's built. Okay. Um, why is energy forced into the water uh, at this northern Atlantic uh, latitude at this point up here? Basically, as this warm air evaporates, uh, you have the water cooling. You also have a higher concentration, right? See, the oceans are salty, and you're losing water due to evaporation. So you've got salty water that's becoming cooler. Cool air sinks, and saline water sinks. Okay, so this water is essentially forced downward like a big pump, and that derives uh, this ocean current around the globe. Okay, so you get deep, cold, salty water, basically an upwelling back here in the Pacific. Uh, water warms again on uh, this type of a belt. Okay, and this is believed to, um, uh, again, affect the climate in, in Europe, and in general, why Europeans are uh, so concerned about this particular issue. Not only are there low levels and even below sea level uh, zones in, in Europe, uh, but also the temperature. Right. So if you have ice melting in, say, Greenland, then uh, you have less salinity, and the pump then, it is thought, will get weaker. Now, this pump has shut off in the past, as I've mentioned before and basically plunging Europe back into a, a mini ice age. This wasn't that long ago, uh, about a thousand years ago. Called it the mini ice age in Europe. Uh, what caused that? 
you know, what were the ter uh, temperature variations? Uh, certainly wasn't carbon dioxide from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, certainly there are other sources there, right? And that's something that uh, people don't have a very good handle on, right? But it happened. And again, the cause and effect, and we can measure glaciers, and glaciers are melting at this time. The, um, um, again, this could be one of the, the surprise consequences. Right? Again, people don't necessarily expect this to happen uh, in the next 10 years. There, actually, there was an article uh, I read um, back in Scientific American about a year ago. Uh, folks up in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, studying this issue are, are very concerned about this issue, uh, more so than the mainstream. Uh, but again, it can be one of those consequences that, frankly, we don't know much about. And if it happened, uh, it might not be the best thing in the world. Question in the back? Um, impact that tectonic plate motion and earthquakes have on this, as far as if you get major pieces of land breaking, it can cause the water around it to shift. I mean, you know that underground and under sea level, the earthquakes are much worse than uh, what we feel on land. So a major shift in that land could cause a, a, a difference in current flow. Uh, it, it potentially could warm up the water, uh, which would lead to the types of consequences that you're talking about here. Uh, but the fact is, you, you can't really deny two facts that are well known. Uh, one is salinity drives the current. We know that. And number two, uh, if that salinity were to disappear, then this ocean current would become weaker. Right? So again, it's not that hard to make a, a logic leap that if temperature increases on average, right, and some of that warming occurs at the poles, then there'll be some ice melting. We are measuring ice melting. Uh, ice breaks uh, both in the Arctic and Antarctic. Again, I mentioned the shipping route that's beginning to open up in the northern Atlantic due to melting ice. Right? This is not hard cause and effect to uh, assume plausible. Of course, it would take a lot of ice to melt uh, for this to happen. Right? So uh, a, a, a total shift in equilibrium uh, isn't expected. But again, it, goes, it just points out the uncertainty. There's uncertainties on both ends. You know, the, on the one side, you can say, well, nothing's going to happen. On the other side, you can say, well, you know, there's going to be dire consequences, right? So things to keep in mind, okay? Um, regional impacts get even harder to predict, right? So, uh, you know, you get really fuzzy when you start talking about things on this slide, right? Uh, great, generally greater surface warming on land than the oceans in the wintertime, right? So these are model predictions. A minimum warning or warming around Antarctica and the northern North Atlantic uh, due to changes in deep oceanic mixing, right, which is what we just mentioned. A maximum warming in the high northern latitudes in the late fall and winter associated with reduced sea ice and snow cover. And some people are concerned about another sort of uh, uh, positive feedback loop uh, related to methane that's locked up in permafrost. Uh, we know that in Canada, in the northern latitudes, there is quite a bit of methane locked up in permafrost. Okay, now, as the winter has become less cold, right, less ice, uh, people are concerned that methane will be released from the permafrost in the northern latitudes. Uh, this would be a positive feedback that would accelerate warming, not decelerate it. Right, because green, uh, methane, as we've talked about, is a potent uh, greenhouse gas. Okay. Again, it, it, you know, one of those positive feedback loops that has very high uncertainty associated with it. Okay. Uh, we talk about uh, little reduction in diurnal temperature rain. This is, uh, this is the uh, um, maximum to minimum daily temperature range. They talk about that reducing over land. And an enhanced global hydrological cycle, this is something that we need to have a very clear understanding of. That, you know, if there's warming, you can expect more evaporation. Some people instantly assume that's going to mean more drought. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, it only means that you'll have more evaporation. That could lead to intense storms, right? And basically shifting the distribution of water. If we look at where cities and populations have popped up, they tend to be near fresh water. Right now, if that water is evaporating at accelerated rates and being dumped somewhere where we're not necessarily settled, right, that may not be necessarily a good thing. And we may perceive that as being a drought. But the fact is, you know, the water isn't necessarily going anywhere. 
right? Mass is still conserved, and water is very stable. Uh, so it's not ending up as hydrogen is, uh, and oxygen, for instance, not being split. Okay. So uh, you know, an, an enhanced global hydrological cycle uh, is something reasonable to expect. A drought, per se, uh, isn't something to necessarily expect. It's just where that water is going to end up. And of course, more energy in the skies, again, it might be plausible uh, to expect more enhanced storms. But again, we're, we're getting out of the range that uh, we can uh, really uh, assume things clearly. OK, and that's basically what this uh, slide is uh, getting to, right? Asian summer monsoon rainfall decreasing, increased precipitation in high latitudes, increased soil moisture in northern latitudes, right? more severe drought in some places, but less severe in others. Greatest impact changes include the in changes in frequencies, intensities, and locations of climate extremes, especially droughts and floods, right, just as we were saying. Okay. But again, these are mostly model-based predictions and probably out of the realm of our everyday experience. Okay. There are, and, and the last bullet is to, is, is to a point that we, we understand a little bit better, right? Sufficient fossil fuel reserves are available to provide for continuing growth of fossil fuel emissions of carbon dioxide. Those emission scenarios uh, do not deplete the amount of carbon we have in the ground to burn. Okay. Uh, so you know, again, depending on the path and where we end up, if we end up in a thousand part per million carbon dioxide atmosphere and accelerate the releases of other greenhouse gases, uh, there could be some surprises right, on either side of zero. All right, so this is you know, the, the sort of categories that we could think about. We could think about human health being affected. And again, it could go in either direction. Uh, you have warmer temperatures, maybe a, a greater spread of disease. Right? You can get into uh, whether more people die when it's warm out or cold out. Uh, I've seen arguments on both sides of that issue. Agriculture could be positively affected. More carbon in the atmosphere. Plants can grow faster. But of course, the zones where the farms are are going to shift. So there'd be some costs, transaction costs, to actually capitalize on that. Right? Is farmland going to move north? For forests, uh, can the trees keep up with the climate migrating north? Uh, for instance, there have been observations in Central America where, uh, due to uh, warming, regional warming, uh, certain climates and species, both plant and animal, uh, that like warm weather, are moving their way up mountains into warmer latitudes. Some species that prefer the colder climates in these mountain regions uh, are uh, becoming extinct. Okay, again, uh, can the forests and these regions of biodiversity uh, maintain or, or keep up with the pace of change? Right, it's a question. Water resources certainly will be affected. Where that water ends up, uh, how much uh, sea level rise? There has been a, a rise in sea level uh, in the last hundred years that people have observed. So the coastal areas will certainly be affected. Uh, glacial ice, again, being affected. Uh, so you can you know, certainly come up with both good and bad uh, with this issue. Uh, but there'll certainly be costs either way right, to adjust to that variability. Right? And, and again, I think we're, we're talking about things that uh, nobody really knows about uh, with any certainty. Okay? But certainly, we have an effect on it. And that much we know that uh, certain decisions that we make as engineers uh, will relate to these emissions. And these emissions relate to our uncertainty. Uh, but on the other hand, just because there's uncertainty doesn't mean we don't know anything. We can't deny that there are greenhouse gases and that these greenhouse gases do affect the temperature uh, in a positive way. All right, so it's only a matter of what this feedback can be and will be. And it's hard to know unless we try it out. And I'm sure in 200 years we'll know. <laughs>